Poof. Poof. And we're back. It's like we never left. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Always macking, never lacking, and constantly, you know what's slapping. What's up, Chucky? What's happening, man? You coming down to the big show in the park on Saturday? What's happening? John Oliver, my man. What do you say? Good to see everybody. What's happening in Stanford, Connecticut, Ray? Yeah. Good to see everybody. I got a good feeling about today's show. I really do. Come on now, Larry the Hunter. I hear you're playing in Murphy's Law on Saturday in the park. Is that right? Arf, arf, arf. Yep. Chris Hoffman, is that right? I, I see that I saw that you're flying up here, right? Is that what's going down, brother? All right, good for you, Larry. You just can't. Murphy's Law will just pull you back in, huh? Come on now, Scott Earth. Silence equals death. What's going on, man? Good, Chris. Make sure you find me, Chris, and say hello. People, you know, people see me, they don't say hello. Don't stare at me. Just come talk to me. Why is that person staring at you? Come on. Good. Do that. That said, listen, we keep, we got to keep, we got a lot going on today. I'm excited about today's guest. Got a lot to talk about. We we managed to survive the Eugene Hutz show. Yeah. We veered into some politics there for a second. Right? Woo. You know? What's going on with this dude, huh? What's up? What's up, what's up? What's up, what's up? Sitting on a train. Hey, hey will you hit some of those buttons behind you for me? Uh, I no. Now you don't want me to do that. <laughs> hey, what does this one do? <laughs> you know, this isn't supposed to go forward. Yeah, they don't. They it frown. They frown upon it when you take the trains out without permission. Especially when you're not dude, an engineer. Remember that dude? There's that dude. Um, that dude here in New York who like is like a chronic like uh, MTA. Train. Oh, I know the guy you're talking about. He stole the subway train. He stole a subway, he stole a couple of us, and every time they let him out, he goes back and does it again. He must have keys, because there's a very specific key you need to do that. Yeah, so. he does. Yeah, yeah. He has keys. He's, like, obsessed with the fucking trains, you know? Amazing. You, you probably bought that shit on Craigslist. Train kept the rolling all night long. She was I, pretty. From uh, New York City. Yep. That's it. Yeah, no, I, I uh, it's nice out is here though you know this is uh i'm getting pretty psyched for saturday yeah yeah i should uh we got good weather you know uh weather weather well how's the weather the uh hell bent for leather hell bent hell bent for leather dun, 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 dun. classic <laughs> yep oh man all right, let's do photo of the day. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, listen. He was insistent. Here it is, photo of the day. Uh -huh. What do we have here? Wrong answers only, please. Photo of the day, wrong answers only, please. All right? I like how you eased in with the first one. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Let's see. Is it? Is it, yo, Steve, we used to get in the conductor booth and talk over the mic back then. Ha, is, that it driving, is, that, is it driving that train high, not high on cocaine? High on caffeine. High on caffeine. Last is thing it, anyone needs. Is it Cy Young? Is it a New York Yankee? Actually, this dude was never a New York Yankee. Nope. Is it Doc Gooden? Nope. Yo, I got news for you. I got news for you, Jose. They ain't making no statues of Doc Gooden. Talk about cocaine. That dude <laughs> flushed his career down. That dude, that dude had it, man. Is it David was, Wells? Uh, Is it David Wells? Was, was they used to call him Dr. K, right? 
That one like, season, he, yeah. that one season that he had was unbelievable. Every time he got on the mound was unbelievable. Good one, Anthony. Is it a pitcher who looked at Medusa? Ha. That's funny. Yep. Sid the kid. Sid the kid. Is that right, Sid? Is that right, Sid? Yeah, I was at that game at Yankee Stadium. All right. But what team was he pitching for? Ah. <laughs> um, is it is it Drew Stone? Ah. Drew made of stone. Is it Drew Stone to the bone? Here is another one. This kind of gives it away a little bit. This is a great a shot. Bit. A it's actually bit. it's actually bronze, by the way. It's bronze. It's bronze. Yeah. There you go. Is it? He was he once. Yeah, I saw I saw that 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 Garrett Cole. I saw the highlights of that. All right, let, let let's let's. Is it that's the starting pitcher for the New York Hardcore Yank Mets? <laughs> Good one. Good one, Chris. All right, let's do right answers. Right answers only, please. And I'll put up the last photo. Hold on. Usually we don't get into the sports thing, but I let this one go for a couple reasons, and I'll tell you why. Is it is it Tom Seaver? 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 Is it Brian Baker's team? Yes. It yes, it is. Is it Jesse Orozco? Good one. Is it Tom Seaver? All right, what is it? Tom Seaver, they, uh, <clears throat> about a week ago now, they, um, they dedicated this statue to Tom Seaver. They just put it up right next door. Now, mind you, I'm a Yankee fan, but, uh, it's literally right next door to me. So I said, I got to walk over and take a picture. And, uh, I mean, this is back when, like, the glory days of baseball, you know, like, you know, and and uh, one of the few baseball players I remember from my youth, really. But it was really cool. I mean, they had a big unveiling. And the next day they gave out, like, little miniature statues of this statue. And... Uh, it's a really nice piece. I was able to walk over when there was no game going on, so I could walk right up to it without any uh, anyone getting in the way. There was a really disgruntled guy sitting in a station wagon next door whose basically only job was to make sure nobody got too close to the statue. Step away. So Hey, uh, got a shout-out, Roy, from Downset, who, who was a, a young, um, very talented baseball player. So, you know, of course – you know, Roy's uh, base. Yes, Jesse Orozco was a left-handed pitcher. Yep. Listen, Tom Tom Seaver got got screwed by the Mets in the end. In the end, they didn't want to. They let him go to what? I think he went to the White Sox. Is that right? Where did Tom Seaver go? To the Reds. Where did Tom Seaver get traded? When the Mets wouldn't pay Tom Seaver, <coughs> cheap that they are, yeah. and they let the franchise guy go. I mean, that's kind of. Where did Tom Seaver go? Was it the Reds or the White Sox? I don't remember. Ah, it was the Reds. It's kind of funny that they, then they put a statue up of him. You know, I mean, like, oops. Yeah, we, you know what? And that, thing, and that thing's called Seaver, Tom Seaver Way, right? Yeah, yeah. Yep. yep. I mean, uh, but he was a pretty, you know, I mean, as players when he was a pretty honorable guy. Like, there was really no drama with him. You know, I mean... There's more drama today than there was with with players back then, you know. And uh, all right, but you know, hey, I, um, I hey, you know what time it is? Uh oh, I think I do. <laughs> Cue it up. <laughs> rat bone, rat bone, rat bone, rat bone, rat bone, rat bone. Hey, bro. Is he sleeping? Oh, there he is. What do you think? What do you yeah, think? Me. Uh, I'm, I'm, can you give me two more minutes? 
no, like, no, no. Pasta. This is it. What's it's what's showtime. Up, it's pasta, bro. You're fucking in my gabagoo right now. <laughs> what's going on? What do you got? Look, I got a cool toy today, guys. What Not, the hell is that in the background? I don't know. They're doing some construction in my building. Yo, you got to pull me back in one minute. Hold on. The, the pasta's burning. <laughs> Love it, right? Give the give the guy his shine, and it's like he, he throws the whole show into uh, into chaos, you know. Be good, <laughs> bro. You're on the clock, man. Here we go. You know what? Here we go. Come on, baby. What's up? Come All right, what do you got? All right, look, I got a really cool one today. I'm gonna save the best one for last. I went to the flea market this week, and I picked up. Just really cool in the box, Aldo model from you know the re-releases were put out. This is Adar, and I forget who put out the re-release, but they put out a re-release of all these. Pretty clean. You never see them in the cellophane like that. Never been opened. So that was one cool thing I scored. And then I'm building up to this because. These cool. I had a little bit of a meltdown at the flea market because the guy had tons of uh, 70s Migos on the card, and they're like, you know, some of them go for 600 bucks, four to 600 bucks. And he was popping them out, and some other dude had like a whole stack of them. And I was just so sad. I was like, I went back late. <laughs> Yo, it really was an emotional day. I kept trying to like pool money together. I was calling, uh, I went nuts. So anyway, I went back the next day and he had a couple laying on the table and I got them instead of a hundred each. I got these for 10 a piece. The Klingon, Migo, very cool. Is he wearing an apron? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's actually- That's, that's, hot, that's yeah, Klingon it's fashion, bro. That's Klingon ah. fashion. It's the same uh, material they used to make the soldier apes jackets actually, but this guy's sweet with his- yeah, with his little bag that's always missing and the little... He's got his little man purse. The only thing that wasn't with it was the uh, no phaser. But you see the bolts on the arm? That's a type one body, like the first. That's how you know it's very early. But look at that paint job. So clean. Nice. There's no, there's no rub on it. You know, when the paint's missing, they call it rub. So those are the... Cool things I found, and the best thing I found this weekend. I like when I find it, because then you're getting it as I'm still excited about it. But I got this bad boy, and this I paid up for a little bit, but probably retails for about a buck fifty, two hundred bucks. And so this is Evil Knievel and the Evil Knievel Shock Absorbing Stunt Cycle. You can make him do wheelies backstands, even mid-air somersaults. And for that big jump, here's Evil, up and over that four-foot ditch. Evil Knievel, sold separately or with the Evil Knievel stunt cycle from Ideal. Evil Knievel, right? I mean, a big part of growing up was Evil Knievel, man. I mean, he, you know what Evil Knievel was to me? Superman that was a real man. Like, that's how it felt when I liked evil and thought evil can evil, you know, like he was incredible, right? So let me show off the bike. And also I got a, I bought it in the box and I just bought it as is. The guy gave me a price and when I got home, it had, it had two of the cycles in it. So I got this one. A super sweet thing about this too is, you know, toys like this, this is always something that would be missing. The little baton. What's that? That's like you know what that looks like. That's look. That looks like what? What was that? That um. What am I thinking of? Like um. In the German army, when you were a field marshal. It's like, like a, a riding crop. It's yeah. not a riding crop. Like like uh, when you when you were a field marshal, you had this. It's like a it's like a baton, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. That? Very cool. There was two of them in there. Two evil Knievels, two bikes, and I think the cool thing about mine, uh, I'm always looking for a uniqueness or something that's off. The the actual cycle thing is, you know, it's just a cheap piece of plastic, 
but they were always red. So I think my yellow one is like more up rare. You know, I, there was a blue one, and I know Bro, we cup. lived in we lived and died by that oh, toy. Man. By that that's toy, man. Day. We we spent we spent we yo. That's the kind of toy you would get back in the day, and you would play with it until you broke it. Right. Yeah. That, I mean, that's what makes <laughs> such. I mean, you could look how clean it is. The bike, nice. And uh. Yeah, I remember if I lost my – the reason I had the Migos, it kind of ties in because, you know, if you lost your Evil Knievel, there was always a Spock that ah. could you know, ride on the bike. So, you know. All right. Well done. That's, hey, I want to play – I got a clip. I got I got a clip, uh, another clip here. As as I grab that other clip, I, this, is, this is the most successful jump that Evil Knievel ever did that he pulled off. Evil Knievel is very intense. We talked to him a few moments ago before he came out of the van. And his total concentration now is getting that bike off the approach ramp and onto the landing ramp. And he's not hesitating. He'll go. I f that was his most successful jump. I looked it up. He actually didn't wipe out and, and hurt himself in that one. What was the distance on that one? I felt, I think it was 12 buses or something like that. Wow. It was Super 12 buses. Cool, bro. Well, well, yeah, well. right. And you know what? La La Larry the Hunter says he was jumping a Harley. The, the thing had no suspension was whatsoever. The thing, you could see, he's <laughs> the thing was a tank, man. A tank. Absolutely. So, I mean, you bet you could probably jump. The, that's like jumping in that train you're sitting in. Yeah. You know? The best was when he jumped the rocket across the whole grand. That, like, yeah, that, that, oh, that I remember that rocket cycle thing. Snake Snake, Snake River uh, Canyon. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Stephen, we'll catch up with you later. All you evil Knievel Saturday. Can't wait to see everyone. So excited. It's like, you know, Christmas for us. It's like going to Disney World or Woodstock or any of those things you could possibly imagine. Like, that lineup's gonna melt faces. It's on, you know. We'll so see you all down Saturday there. in the park and uh Saturday so in the park. Do you know who did that, Rat Bones? Uh Chicago. Nice. Wish you would have wanted you laugh. People oh. laughing. I'm not hating on Chicago these days. That's a real summertime. Seven. It used to be on my like, yo, fuck them like list, but like with Phil Collins and Billy Joel, but like I like kind of I like Chicago now. The Hall of Notes, got to be in the right mood. Listen, don't get crazy, bro. <laughs> Let's not get crazy. Don't try to slip Hall of Notes in with Chicago, <laughs> dude. Yo, Terry Kath, what you know about Terry Kath? All right, I'll see you later, All right, bro. Later, guys. Peace. All right. Rat bone, rat bone, rat bone, rat bone, rat bone, rat bone. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. That's right. Before we bring our guests down, we are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill, The Texas Silver Rush, DTF, DTFM Vinyl Distro, Chacho's Tacos, 126 Hardcore Clothing, and Chain Reaction Records and Skateboards, located in Lakewood, Colorado, is the Rocky Mountain headquarters for all things punk, hardcore, and metal. Established in 2014, they have the largest selection of records, CDs, shirts, stickers, patches, and accessories between Chicago and Los Angeles. Goddamn electric. From the pit to the ditch, they got your back. They got your back. Get in touch with them at www.chainreactionrecords.com. Come on now, Lee and Debo to Pro. New York Hardcore Comics opened in 2013, selling comic books, punk rock, and hardcore memorabilia. Toys, statues, skateboard decks, tapes, vinyl, and all things horror. We love helping bands push their demos and new tracks, so please stop by and drop off your new music, even if your band friggin' sucks. We have in-store events like Magic the Gathering and Warhammer tournaments, plus meet and greets with bands and some live performances. Open seven days a week and shipping worldwide. Find us online through 
Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and eBay, located at 117 Main Street, lovely Dobbs Ferry, New York, www.NewYorkHardcoreComics.com. Last but not least, before we bring our guest on, come on now, 126 Hardcore Clothing is a streetwear brand for restless individuals like you, my hardcore friend, who don't compromise. They're about being positive, spontaneous, and true to yourself. For years, they experimented with several printing methods and materials and collaborated with a large number of designers and illustrators, always giving room for fresh perspectives while retaining the hardcore attitude. Don't care what you may say. We got that attitude. Get in touch with them and ramp up your game at www.126clothing.com. Hey, for those out there that may be wondering right about now what is happening outside my window, here you go. Not too much. <laughs> That's what's going on outside my window, West 86th Street here in New York City, right? My lovely, my lovely neighborhood. There you go. Everybody good? You got your merchant, you got your merchant in where, Frank? Joe Frank? In uh in New York Hardcore Comics? Is that right? Okay. Yeah, Terry Kath is dead. We know Terry Kath is dead. Terry, Terry Kath. You know who you know how Derek, you know how Terry Kath died? Anybody? Kind of crazy. I'll answer that one. Terry Kath died, apparently, playing Russian roulette with his roadie. So there you go. Hey ho, let's go. There you go. Let's get it on. Today's guest. Let me clear the deck. Let me clear the deck. What the heck? Let's get rid of all this chazarai and let's bring our guest on. Today's guest is an American musician, audio engineer, producer, and music editor hailing from Hermosa Beach, California. In his incredibly proficient career, he is known for his work with the bands Descendants, Doggy Style, Dag Nasty, Doug C and the Blacklisted, For Love Not Lisa, Cottonmouth Kings, Daddy X, and currently Field Day. Please welcome, coming at us from the City of Angels, Mr. Doug Carrion. Hey! Greetings from the interwebs. What's going on? How are you? It is freaking fantastic to be here on 420. Thank you from the bottom of my ragged heart for having me out. It's great. What the F is going on, man? I'm going to keep it kind of Bugs Bunny today because I'm not quite sure. I don't want to get censored. So I'm just going to throw, I'm not going to throw too many F bombs and things yeah, like that. You know, you don't want to get too, you want to get too crazy. But, um, but yeah, it is 420, huh? How about that? Oh, yes. So what's going on? This, I'm going way back on the clock to all the freaking Clapmouth Kings and Queens. Oh, 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 what's up? <laughs> D-Loke, I know you reached out to me just the other day. How are you, brother? I see you. I still see you fighting the fight. Freaking badass, brother. Keep going. <laughs> hit a fool when, you know, hit me when you get back on the West <laughs> Coast. For sure. I'd love to catch up with you. Whatever. Let's all talk right. punk rock and all that. Uh, Yo. <laughs> <laughs> um, listen, Nick, all you guys, we're going to do questions at the, at, towards the end of the show. So we're going to get to all that. Let's, uh, let, let's go through the, let's go through the routine. Um, Hey, what's the latest, Doug? What's happening? How did how did the um how the, the the pandemic treat you? What's going on? What's the latest? Dude, I don't even know where to start with that one, but let's see. The the latest is I maybe I'll go now and work my way backwards. <laughs> so the the latest is um Peter and I started a project called Field Day and we've been doing shows and releasing music and all that stuff. The pandemic, although it completely blows cuz you know, you don't want people to get sick and all that stuff. It actually, in a way, similar to you, where you created the show during the pandemic, we we leaned right into recording quite a bit. So um, for the most part, like we utilized the downtime of um, COVID and recorded and released music and all that. So now that kind of everybody's, it's like Groundhog's Day, everybody's kind of coming up, coming up for air and, and stuff. We're back out doing shows. So that's kind of what's going on. Like lit literally like right now, like that's what's happening. That's the bam, 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 right on the, on the button. That's what's going on. And here it is. I'm sorry. I, I was, I was, yeah. I was fumbling, looking, I was fumbling, looking, looking for this. 
Is this tell us the is this the current lineup? No. So that one I can see the only difference is that Mark Phillips is not in the band. He joined Fishbone and Shay Mirdead plays guitar. And Shay is like from Faded Gray and Kurt, he's like a hardcore guy from Vegas. Got Up and die. He played with a lot of those those bands. Freaking shredder shredder melting melting fretboards <laughs> coast to coast shredder shredder right on so um how did you come up where were you born um where were you raised did you grow up in a musical household born in i b- believe it or not i was born in queens so i was born in queens forest hills hospital Ooh, whoa. Uh, uh, so whoa. there you go whoa. a lot of people Stone don't know row, bro yes hospital Yes, I too. I too was born in Forest Hills. Get the f out. So I was my born ma- in Booth. I was born in Booth Memorial, but that's badass. So so my mom's, y- you know the drill. Like I'm freaking Italian. So like the, my grandma ah. came came over from the thing, and she did the thing, and my mom ended up being born in Brooklyn. So my mom's from Brooklyn, and then I was born over in that part of the world, and and lived there until I was around four or so. Believe it or not, I lived um, on 8th Street right next to Electric Ladyland, like wow. as, a, as a teeny bopper. And then by about maybe four and a little bit, four and change, my mom moved me to Hermosa Beach, California. My mom and my brother and my sister and myself. Uh, yeah, so I grew up in Hermosa Beach, California. How, how old were the, you when you moved? How old were like, you when you like moved to Hermosa? Four, like four. four. I hadn't started kindergarten yet, but I was definitely like old enough to, yeah, I was like four. You know, wow. so, but being a, being a street savvy kind of like kid, like by the time I got Hermosa beach is kind of like a sleepy beach town. So at four, I was kind of unmonitored. Like my mom would just let me roll. <laughs> so that's it. That's kind of the, well, that's kind of the deal. Musical household. I, I, I'll, I'll answer your question. Um, my mom, more of a music influencer on me, like, you know, wide variety of music from, uh, Chambers Brothers, James Brown, Sly and the Family Stone, Beatles, blah, 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 across the board. So my mom was ahead of the curve on um, music and kind of exposed me to all kinds of different things. And by the time I got into the into the living in Hermosa Beach, um, there was like music was going all over the place. And, and I would give my mom credit for really introducing me to jazz. So I did a deep dive into jazz before I got into punk rock. I was like way more likely to be a jazz guy, like in, in you know, Chet Baker and Ornette Coleman and Miles Davis and shit like that. So that's kind of the, the thing. Now I, 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 I um, saw and re- I did my homework and, and by the way, by the way, I'm six months older than you. So we, we, we basically the same age. Yeah. It's rad. Yeah. You look and, way better though. You look way better, bro. You know what my secret is? As, as a young person, not anymore, but I did a lot of drugs and I slept with a lot of people. That's beautiful. That's a beautiful thing. But you see, the thing is, is you <laughs> learned, you, you knew when to turn the page, right? I've been clean and sober 13 years now. Right. So there you go. So you learn. I mean, I was listening and to I'm the- being, wall- And I'm being, I'm being a little silly here, but yeah. But, but see, the thing is, is like- I, that's kind of like growing up at that time. That's part of the culture. So just, just that's how that is. But what's rad is like, you're still going and you're finding things that you think are interesting and you connect with people that you've had friendships with since you were, geez, like in your twenties. We could do a little bit of a dive on that. You you know, it's interesting because having getting gotten into the hardcore thing, you know, a little bit later on and, and then eventually of course, like the straight edge thing came into my orbit but like I grew up in New York City. I went to public school in New York City. And when I was a teenager in the late 70s in, into 1980, like everyone I know was was getting high, smoking grass, doing drugs. It mm-hmm. was absolutely a part of the culture. Mm-hmm. And I was never even it wasn't even an option. There was nothing else. It's what you did if you were a teenager growing up in the 70s. And, and, and that, that was part of it. It wasn't until actually for me. It wasn't until I went to college in Boston in 1981. I went to Emerson College. I fell in with the SSD control crew. Oh, and of wow. course, Minor Threat. 
you know, and then the, the straight edge. Came, and that was the first time I ever, oh, wow, there's people that actually don't do that. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. I, I think like in a, in a similar way, like part of the, the beat, definitely part of the beach culture, it's ingrained in, in like the, the drug culture, weed drinking, yeah. da, 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 da. it's just in there. And then, um, you know, I mean, wasn't, as, that, wasn't that a part of like growing up like at Hermosa Beach? Like I, I, I like like Keith Morris, like yeah. I was so wasted. Yeah. No, I was out yeah. on the strand and yeah. all that, you know? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, in fact, to tie that to like to tie that to punk rock, like um, you know, the line like 65 valiant and a handful of valiums and stuff like that. It's like that's that's kind of that culture. Right. You know, there was a lot right. of like speed and drugs and coke and da, 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 da. Sure, it's just kind sure. of the norm um yeah that's just kind of the norm you know that's just our, rs70 rs70 way. puts out there that wasn't the church where black flag and circle jerks wasn't that hermosa beach now when yeah. i think of hermosa beach i think of black flag i mean mm -hmm. so when, when you were when you were coming up i mean those guys aren't that much older than us but but at what point did sort of that stuff come into your into your uh orbit so so as a, as a teeny bopper listening to my, you know, freaking Dizzy Gillespie and all my weird jazz music, as one time I was skateboarding down the strand and I'm doing a thing and I saw a black flag flyer and uh -huh. I, and when I saw the black flag flyer and it was like the, the, the one with the devil horns on it, I think it was for the Stardust Ballroom show. Sure, That sure. was kind of a changing point in my life where I realized like, oh shit, there's a whole nother yeah. thing cropping up and and being so closely tied to the surf and skate culture in Hermosa Beach like I grew up a block away from the beach so I surfed and skated the same way you might be able to like you know how to ice skate and play hockey and shit like that I couldn't do that for the life of me but I could freaking throw down on a skateboard and surf that because I grew up at the beach um and so I, I really like as once I saw what was going on with the black flag thing, I knew that there was a turning, there was going to be a changing of the guards and all of my friends started getting more into aggressive music, faster mm. music, um, surfing and skating kind of was a great uh, extension of that. And I was kind of all in, it was, it was an all in thing for me. So by the time I saw that and, and, you know, was going to see circle jerks and, uh, uh, bands like that like blistering fast bands it just it kind of went with the the fast lifestyle you know the I, fast I saw, beach lifestyle i saw you mention um uh, I'm, I'm quoting here uh, uh, i'm quoting you here uh but here's the connection the first couple of times i heard black flag because greg ginn's guitar style was always so different i always thought that it was a kind of like jazz in the improvisational sense it is no surprise that I would go to find the Minutemen. So I came up the ranks more like a bebop guy, kind of guy with very angular music. Was I knowledgeable about Kiss? Yes. Was I knowledgeable about Ted Nugent Aerosmith? Yes. But the stuff I listened to most of the time, pre-punk, was always jazz music. And I have this here. And tell us a little bit about, about this place. Boom. I don't see it. Oh, okay. So the lighthouse, this is, this is, the lighthouse is basically a place, I want to say it came up in the 50s. And so this is the place where I saw jazz as a kid when I was nine. But guess whose freaking mom and dad were booking it back then? Dezo's oh. mom and dad. Des, Des from Black Flag? Yes. And wow. across the street from that, across the street would have been Red's freaking bait and tackle so keith morris's dad owned the fishing shop like across wow. the street which is where i would have met bill stevenson young keith young bill because it's look at that freaking that's like the beach community so sure. as as wild as that photo is that's also like yep that would be like the next generation would be shit that's dezo's mom and dad ran that place forever <laughs> You, you know what's amazing? Look at the cars that are in front. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> that yeah. station wagon is just wow. You don't yeah. see those. And that's know. like, and that's the, um, you know, 
we're, we're going back to counterculture and, and, and things like that. Like, this is just the norm for me. That would be, just be the norm where uh, hippies and people that were into jazz and, and that's just all kind of part of a subculture that really didn't want to be overly, um, uh, just didn't really, just wanted, was very happy being in its own lane. <laughs> just Christopher, own Christopher Valdez lane. says, Des Kadena's dad was Ozzy, Ozzy, Ozzy? Yes, Ozzie? yes, yes. Ozzie? Yes. Kadena, a heavy yes. cat. You know? Yes. Yes. That's so cool. also, if you're looking at this photo here, not, I mean, the Hermosa Beach and South Bay people will know what I'm talking about, but we're talking not one block, but a block and a half away would be where the church was right, right. up. The, the right infamous up. black flag yeah. church. Right. 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 And so, so at this time during like, What's amazing about this, and, and I'm going to go with that, like looking at the station wagon, this looks like this is from the late 50s. I'm gonna you would say. think so, yeah. I, okay, so you figure by the time I got there in the 70s, maybe the beach, this particular community had already had its peak and was kind of like there were a I lot see. of abandoned buildings and shit I like see. that back then yeah. so the church the reason why the guys commandeered the church and i'm not going to be a, a guy that just that's because it was at that point the hippie culture uh uh didn't really have that much money and so those buildings were kind of left available. And so Ginn was like, oh, I'll, I can commandeer this sure. place and live there. So to go a little bit further from where the church was all the way up to Pacific Coast Highway, I remember there were um, almost like small storage sheds that were to the, to the left. So on the north side of Pier Avenue by the high school that were all just like maybe they were shops and then the shops – didn't really venture very well and eventually kind of died. And the hippies who were always looking for cheap places to put on, uh, to have like studios to make art and things like mm -hmm. that always took over those places. That's so that's kind of yeah. how. Now, now, now the, the high school you're mentioning, is that Mira Costa high school? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, yeah, and, yeah, you, you, and, and, and actually but, but, but before we, we delve into that mm -hmm. at this point, it, it, what age did you pick up an instrument and what instrument did you pick up and, and, and why, why did that instrument speak to you? Um, well, so it would probably would have been a, when I was about 14, 13, 14. So around sophomore and uh -huh. uh, sophomore and um, my English teacher, when I was going to school had given me an acoustic guitar and knew that I kind of had like a lot of energy and wanted to point it in a d different direction and mm -hmm. was like, here, take this and see if you can make something work from it. And so within a very quick amount of time, I was like, oh shit, I can play a Ramon song. And then that kind of just built on it. And so I really started playing acoustic guitar as a kid or, or probably like 14, 15 given to me by my English teacher who thought that I had a lot of energy and figured like, you could that's cool probably and i guess then the art side of me the artistic side of me never really neat wanted to or had any desire to really go like to be a shredder i just looked at that like the acoustic guitar was just a medium to make sounds the same way i would have been a kid that set up all my pots and pans and glasses with different amounts of water in them to do percussion in my kitchen. So it just, just so happened that it was like the guitar was maybe like, Oh shit, other people play guitar. I kind of get it, but I could have, I'm now going back to the jazz thing. I could have just as easily been a guy that like freaking just did more of, of the art stuff and didn't even play an instrument, you know, maybe like scraped on um, pieces of metal. Like performance art could have did just you, as easily you, been my, you, my role. Who were your early? Uh, did you, uh, let me go with this. Um, you saw shows at the Lighthouse. Yeah, like well, because remember Ray, Hogan, Ray was, Hogan asks best show at the Lighthouse. Well, for me, I'm gonna go. I don't remember because I was nine, but oh, I can tell cool. you this: at the Lighthouse was the first time I saw piano, bass 
and drums. And I knew like, oh shit, that's a, like, that's an amazing trio because the piano player could hold the melody and solo and the bass and the drums just kind of were, were back that way. And so not until later would have been that I was like, oh, well, no wonder I love Nat Cole trio. <laughs> you know, things like that. So I would, I would go with, I don't remember, but those Sunday brunches, because it, go, answering your question, because it was 21 and up, th- I wasn't allowed in there. But wow. on Sunday when they served food, that's when my moms took me there to see, to see. see the stuff. And I was like, oh, shit. Like, that's, that's how that's done. And then way later in my adult life, I, I got to see you know, Oscar Peterson and, there you, go. you know, freaking swinger, just rippers, yeah. rippers, you know, yeah. and, and was humbled, you know, humbled and, and kind of tripped out by how people could make um, uh, their subconscious role really far out there into music. So it was really kind of crazy. So you went, you went to Mira Costa high school mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. and, that's where you met up with the guys from Descendants, right? Sure. So for Maricosa, Maricosa, um, I met Bill in my freshman year. And wow. Bill and Bill is, I think he's two grades older than I am. So he would have been about a junior. And he was as quirky and eccentric as you could imagine, more into fishing. And I was more into skateboarding and surfing. And so we had this, we had this public speaking class together and he would always do um, lectures and speeches about like how to smoke fish or why a certain rod worked a certain way. Uh, And I would always do like why certain trucks worked a certain way or why fins on surfboards worked a certain way or why surfing was what I did. And so we kind of met each other that way. Uh, Milo same grade as Bill, I really didn't know other than Milo was like the guy that was like uh, on track and would like run. And so I would <laughs> always, I would always be at like PCH and Artesia and I would see him like at the traffic light running in place. And I'd be like, Oh shit, that's that Milo guy. And he just, he, uh, he talk about a guy that stayed in his own lane. That guy really stayed in his own lane. Yeah. Um, and I knew him only tangentially through other people uh, and I knew that he played in Descendants and stuff like that, but he was always like just off doing his own thing. And, and we'll, we'll get in, and, and we'll get into and we'll get into how you got you got uh, pulled into the band. But tell us about um, what's happening here. And I believe this is your first band, Con Eight Hundred. Right. So I'm probably I want to say I'm a junior. I maybe I'm a junior or a senior in high school, so I'm 16, 16, 17, 16. And so this is kind of hundreds of uh, a punk band, a hard I guess you could say a hardcore band from Hermosa Beach, which is the first band that I was in with Fletcher from Pennywise. And so amazingly enough, um, there they Fletcher, we all kind of hung out at the beach in this in this. Uh, by this school called Robinson and Robinson, the drummer of this band lived right catty corner to the school, like right there. And so we would hang out in the parking lot and skate. And then we would have like band practice at Hank's house and his, he lived with his, his grandma and his uh, grandpa and we'd make noise. And that's kind of it. Um, Everybody went there. Think, think kind of like uh, the little rascals and everybody would hang out at one Sure. Parking lot. Well, it just so happened that everybody like would do, everybody would take a turn kind of singing. Mm. I know that sounds totally lame, but it was like everybody would take a turn hey, singing. When, when you're a young teenager, that's how everybody, it, that, it's a lot of fun. And, 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 and yeah. so, and so the roles aren't, the roles aren't so defined when you're, when it, you're that age. Not at all. Not at all. And so Fletcher who lived kind of close by and everybody lived close by for whatever reason, um, the mic, either somebody went on a bathroom break or whatever it was. And I grabbed the mic and I'm like, okay, here, I can try one. And I have kind of like a, for a guy, that's a small guy. Uh, uh I have kind of like a pretty deep, hardcore kind of growl. <laughs> and Fletcher was like, that's the best thing ever. And the, I just, for whatever reason in that, like two year, maybe a two year period, I was the guy that like growled. 
<laughs> very, very SOA minor threat kind of a, approach to the vocals, you know, and that particular band doesn't play very often. It plays maybe like once every 10 years or something, but there's footage of, of it. And it's like, yep, that's, that's, and the, to, what's really funny is to think like, like, Fletcher's just a freaking refrigerator. He's just a giant guy and I'm a small guy. So it's mm -hmm. like the, the juxtaposition between the two is kind of kind of clever on stage. Yes, but, yeah, we'll D, yes. Fletcher done. from Pennywise. Yes. For sure. For yes. sure. That's it. And and um this is a minor threat picture, right? Correct. And yes. that's you on the on the right. Yeah, that's and, me on the right smiling, like the guy smiling just, just like, behind just, the just other like guy. In I'm the at a, like I'm at a minor threat show and I'm stoked. I had waited a long time for them to come through. And by the time they got to go through it and, and the show was crowded, but it wasn't something that was like overly packed. It was like, Where was it was a this? Good, this was at Dancing Waters in San Pedro in July of 82. Wow. Um, so you figure like I'm, I'm 17 for sure. And yeah, it was, it was a mind melting experience to see kind of like to see them and see how it was for, they were four band, four member band. They hadn't added Steve yet and they just freaking ripped. And uh, it was a, a lot of fun. And also it was one of those things like the, the, the South Bay and the Los Angeles punk people didn't do the sing along thing like the East coast people. It's very, you know, very different. And I hadn't seen any California shows do the sing along thing until I had seen seven seconds, uh, seven seconds descendants at the farm in San Francisco way in 85 or so. So it's kind of badass to see that. Um, and yeah, they were everything you could imagine. <laughs> Freaking on point. Totally. Yeah, on point. I, I saw them a couple of times in that. Uh, they were great. They you know, what's, they, they were all they, they, they never there were certain bands in that era. I mean, and maybe it was my youthful exuberance, mm -hmm. but I saw Black Flag many times. Mm -hmm. I saw Bad Brains because I was on the East Coast here. Mm -hmm. I saw the Bad Brains from, you know, 1981 to when they stopped. I probably saw them, you know, 15 times. Mm -hmm. And I saw Minor Thread a bunch of times. Those bands were always great. And the yeah. Misfits. The Misfits, yeah. we, I love them. They were always great too. I got to see the Misfits a couple times too from that from that time. They were fun. Period. They were fun. Um, and they were great. And what's amazing ab about the Minor Threat photo, had you told me that like two years later, I'd be sleeping on Ian's couch at Discord House, I never would have believed you. I'd be like, you're freaking crazy. Like there's no way. Yeah. Um, and I guess you could say that goes – that photo is true to form in like how much I love music and am a music fan. It's like, yeah. yep, I love, I love music. I love music. It, it reminds me that, that I showed you that black flag shot um, mm -hmm. of me. Let me see if I can find it. For um, sure. Let's see. Uh, probably not. Um, but yeah, I showed you that black flag where, I, where I'm the same age as you. I'm in the same spot. I have the same look on my face. Yeah, City you Gardens. Know? Yeah. For sure. City Gardens. Yeah. Um, how did, so how did the, at 20 years old in 1986, you ended up in The Descendants and you played on the, you played on this record, door, door, door. You played on this record. Tell us how The Descendants, uh, your, your, the, the, the Descendants um, stint came to be? Mm -hmm. So going back to the jazz and the noise and the Minutemen thing, mm -hmm. okay, after I had left the band with Fletcher and I, I started doing the, the Los Angeles punk scene had gotten even more crazy with the gangs and stuff like that, Nazis and gangs and stuff. And it just was really was, it started to become not fun to go to shows. Uh, and so I started going you know, there, there's a parallel between, or at least at that time, there was a parallel between uh, the punk world that was the, like, I guess you could say the punk hardcore world and the kind of like punk art world. And so I just jumped more into the art world lane and I was doing a band called Incest Cattle, which was like the birthday party, super angular, super noisy. Einstein's a Neubot and very noisy like that. Um, the drummer, Paul, was friends with Bill and 
had given Bill a demo and said, yeah, I do a band with Doug. Do you know Doug? And so that's kind of how Bill, it, the bell went off and Bill was like, oh shit, Doug plays bass. A bunch of years later, mm -hmm. um, after that band had crashed and burned, um, Bill, basically the beach is such a small community. Bill like knew where I lived and came to my house. I wasn't home, writes a note, tapes it to my door and is like, Hey, this is Bill. Can you reach out to me at SST? So that's how far back that goes. Um, I, I call him, he's at SST. He comes, he drives his gray van down to the beach. Um, we're hanging out and, and he's, he's kind of secretive about what he's doing. Um, and he says to me, he's like, dude, I'm going to reboot Descendants. And I'm like, holy shit, really? Uh, and he's like, but Tony can't do it because um, Tony has work obligations. So would you be interested in trying out? I'm like, for a 3,000% sure. He's like, where do you rehearse? I go right here at the house. And so he wheels his <laughs> drums around the back. And again, we're beach house, small, teeny, teeny houses close to each other. We <laughs> load in his drums. And we just did a bass and drum jam, like, for about probably about two hours and he was kind of like playing different riffs and we just uh -huh. just you know there's a thing about just playing music and we just played music and we just jammed and improvised and did a lot of that and i think he kind of wa was a little taken back at like i could kind of hold my own wherever he was going we took a break we went to la panita which was super close by and had some mexican food and then he was like you know do you want to come up to ssc and jam with ray Sure. So we throw my gear up into, yeah, we throw my gear in the car and we head up to SST and start jamming with Ray. And SST was on Santa Monica Boulevard? No, SST would have been on Artesia at like Artesia and Inglewood. It had moved around a little bit. Okay. Um, it had moved around a little bit. So uh, by that time, by that time, it was um, there at Artesia and uh, 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 Inglewood. And yeah. they kind of had like the offices and the rehearsal rooms and stuff like that. And we played and jammed and played and jammed and played and jammed. And then that night he was like, Hey dude, we're mixing. I don't want to grow up. Do you want to come listen to the mixes of the new record? And I'm like, sure. <laughs> and yeah. so that kind of like, that was it. And then from there, it just like, we just hung out and we just hung out every day and just made music and talked about music and listened to records and, played and wrote songs and that i was mean i always it always was. looked to me like like anybody who joined black flag or, or or the descendants it was like boot camp right yeah you yeah, just look like like intense rehearsals and just yeah, yeah. Meanwhile, you know, meanwhile here on the east coast we like no like nobody ever rehearsed we just played right. shows so <laughs> so it's funny that you mentioned that like a normal descendants week would be rehearsing every day like you rehearse every day seven days a week every day unless there's some kind of problem it also um descendants there was a time where bill he probably doesn't remember this but there were times where he would intentionally set up extra lighting in the um rehearsal room like heat lamps so oh. when we were rehearsing we could rehearse like this is what it's like when you're playing in a hot club at 120 wow, that's degrees interesting. That's interesting. So we were yeah. we were always what, what we'll call conditioning for sure. that. Um, yeah, and you, that's you know, really, that's you just, really interesting. I've never yeah. heard that, that that like to to sort of create the environment. Like this is what it's real, you know, it, it, what, sure. what it's really what it's really gonna what it's really gonna be like. It's like, and sometimes I think you know, being a singer and a front man, mm -hmm. you know, what I should do is I should get out and run, and as I'm running do my vocals because that's pretty much exactly what it mm -hmm. is when we play a show. I'm mm -hmm. nonstop moving. It's like I'm running, but mm -hmm. you know, it, it, that doesn't, <laughs> you know, uh, there's a, there's a reason why, uh, there's a reason why Mick Jagger is, is yeah. a freaking marathon runner, dude. Like that guy can, he, he has advanced cardio, <laughs> advanced yeah. cardio. And when yeah. you do, you know, punk vocals and, and, and hardcore vocals, it's like, it takes a lot of, um, to do it right, I guess you could say it takes a lot of cardio and stamina. And then if you're a guy that's jumping around, like think about how gnarly HR's 
cardio must have been in the early 80s yeah. to be able to do that kind of performance. And that guy was moving and jumping and flipping yeah, he was and intense. all the time. He, he was if, like he was like a fire hydrant. He was a right. he was like a, a fi- that guy was that guy was stacked. And if you listen to like if you if you listen to interviews or stories about him, he could have just as easily been like an Olympic yeah, athlete right. like you're like one of those guys like oh <laughs> advanced cardio but so long story long with descendants when you talk about boot camp it was definitely like you got used to playing every night because that's what you did you're either sure. playing or you're doing a show playing like that's right. the norm any any recollections of recording this record uh any insight you can give us um yeah for the most part the record was recorded twice it was recorded at radio tokyo with richard andrews so it was recorded in venice um and the first time we tracked everything bill didn't really like the he didn't really like the pockets that we were hitting so we actually went out and toured and played a bunch of the material live and then went back and recorded it again. <laughs> Grateful so, Dead style. Right? Yeah. So, go, out so, and work, go out and work the material out a little bit. I, mm-hmm. Shit. I wish yeah, we could do that. Because you can, because you, I think what happens is you can see what song, I, sometimes things are so much different now versus back in the dinosaur day. Um, yeah. You know, back in the dinosaur day, fans, were a little bit more open to letting bands just play their whole new record top to bottom or whatever, like, like just, you know, as opposed to a greatest hits. Now we're in very like a greatest hits kind of, you know, world, but there was a time where like, you know, putting, going to like Dag Nasty, for example, Dag Nasty, when we did Wig Out at Dankos, we just turned, we just like, okay, here's the new record. And we just started playing it. Sure. <laughs> and that was that, you know, that was yeah. that. You know, descendants would be the same, like, okay, here we go. And then you throw in the songs or whatever. Look, a young Doug, you know, there I am. Yeah. All in, bla- all in black. Yeah. <laughs> so was it um what was it a um was it a enjoyable run and why did it come to an end? A totally enjoyable one, super funny and spastic and the nicest people in the world. I'm still v- friendly with all of them. Yeah, um, I can see that. They, they yeah, seem like, to be yeah. like really like really friendly like we're really we're still friends um in fact field day did a hit just recently we were in san pedro milo rolls out jumps up and sings safe with us bill and i still talk often um Mm -hmm. peter and i will go when whenever peter is in town and we'll go see them like we recently saw them when they played with rise against in uh i don't know they were down in like laguna or orange county or something so we're still friendly that came to an end only in that Punk at that time, there really was no career path. Yeah. There's no career path. There was and that, I, that that painful lull in like the the late 80s, right? And I and and where we were was first off, Descendants is Bill's band. He's a phenomenal writer. They're great guys and great writers. He wanted to go more on that process of weeding out fusion-y kind of world, sure, where sure. I was leaning a little bit more in the like one minute, 30 second Milo goes to college nugget. So yeah. that's kind of it. But was there any like beef or bad blood or anything like that? Hell no. In right. fact, um, one of the greatest things, even now, like I was l- watching on, on the run up with you hanging with your friends and talking and, you know, those are guys that you've known from your late teens, early twenties or whatever. And it's like, I think that when you can have a friendship with people decades into it and you still appreciate their quirks and senses of humor and stuff like that. And, sure. and that's something that although my, my, although my time playing with them was a, you know, a couple of years or whatever it is, yeah, our friendship has remained. And like, I would be like, there are a gazillion times where I would go see descendants play and I would just roll at sound check, just roll up and see them <laughs> and then yeah. say, Hey dudes, what's up? And hang out and we'd have lunch. And so we've always maintained a really positive friendship. And a lot of the people that I grew up with from the beach, um, I know before it, you and I were talking about Kevin Sulk, you know, a lot of, a lot of those people, are, it's the same. It's like, they're the, they're, you're happy to see them. They're happy to see you. And, and you, you're kind of, you scratch your head. And you're like, Holy shit. Are we still here? Still going? Yeah, they've they've 
they've um, aged well. I mean, in the regard that, you know, they're, they're you know, descendants are, are a really big act now and they're great. Huge. And, and Huge. They're, 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 they're awesome. Joe Ackerman, are you, are you, listen, what are you just showing up at the party, man? Uh, enjoy. He played, he played on enjoy, buddy. That's yeah. That's the album. That, that's that, okay. that, that, yeah. That's the album that, uh, yeah, and, and, that, Doug, and, uh, that Doug played with the Descendants. Yep. And, and I guess, like, if you're a Descendants kind of like person and on the arc, the one that's the most notable is like, I wrote the music for um, Sour Grapes, and Sour Grapes would have been one of those songs where it was the first time Descendants did something that was more of a straight line bass line, more of a straight eight, straight 16s, which was kind of something different compared to how they would normally play suburban law uh, you know, uh suburban home and stuff like that where it was real yeah. busy or bass parts mm -hmm. um but yeah so that's kind of that that's that super fun great guys no drama like only posy 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 and that's cool yeah right <laughs> like super hey, cool. um let's let's take a let me take a sponsor break let me shout yeah. out some sponsors we're Ooh. gonna bring in one of our sponsors for a couple minutes and when we come back let's get into some dag nasty stuff huh for sure What's happening? This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live, and our guest today is Doug Carrion from currently Field Day, formerly Descendants, Dag Nasty, Cottonmouth Kings, a very, very proficient musician. Uh, we're excited to have him on. Um, yes, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna get down today. Um, it's nice to see you out there. We are sponsored by. We are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, the Texas Silver Rush, Chain Reaction Records, and Skateboards, DTFM Vinyl Distro, Chachos Tacos, Generation Records, 126 Hardcore Clothing, and they just moved. Organic Grill. It's a vegan restaurant located at 133 3rd Street on the corner of 6th Avenue, right next to the Blue Note. Featured in New York Magazine, New York Times, and Veg News, their dishes have won numerous awards, including Best Veggie Burger. They make their own cheeses, sausages, and burger patties, and every dish on the menu can be made gluten free. They've now, the new location, it's on. Got to write up some new text for them, too. This, you know, how classic, how classic has this been, though? We have to keep some of the great stuff in it. Also, let me shout out Joe Romini, Vinny Stigma's cousin, and the Texas Silver Rush. They are a jewelry design firm and boutique store located in the birthplace of the Texas country music scene in Fredericksburg, Texas. They specialize in work with musicians in all music genres to design and create unique one-off pieces, as well as style them for stage, album covers, promo photos, and social media exposure. Their client list includes Rock Roll Hall of Famous, Greg Rolay, Ringo Starr, and of course, Agnostic Front. Information and online sales are being taken at their Facebook and Instagram pages, and of course, www.thetexassilverrush.com. Want to mention to you, yes, you, my friend, the next four shows coming up. Will be. Boom. I think there's one in there. I think there's one in there we haven't really even announced yet. Um, next four shows. This Sunday, in a couple days, the day after the big show in the park, is the Lemoors retrospective with DJ Alex Kane. A week from today is Carl Kennedy uh, from The Rods and the Megaforce in-house producer. Of course, he produced the early Anthrax stuff, uh, Blue Cheer. And uh, Overkill, Sunday, May 1st is Mr. Caves. And Sunday, May 8th, we have not announced this, but here we go. Bill Manspeaker and Kevin Vonsper. Uh, Bill Manspeaker is the force, um, the, 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 the man behind the, the green jelly or green jello. You may remember them. And uh, Kevin is also in green jelly. They have a, Kevin just directed a film called The Life and Slimes of Dookie Flyswatter Haunted Garage. Really interesting film. You know I like bringing filmmakers on here. Um, Bill Mann, speaker from Green Jelly, a really interesting guy. Um, so there's going to be a lot to talk about with this show. Um, yes, Green Jelly. Yep. Yes, Caves. Caves will be on the show too. I know we can't get rid of the gluten-free. I know we can't. So, yeah. So that's so though, and then you know, while we're at it, let's do the next next four shows. And the next next four shows coming up on Sunday, May 
15th is the light speaking of film life of agony sound of scars documentary show with director lay brooks joey z and alan robert i'm holding off i have to watch this documentary i know a lot of you have seen it um i will be watching it soon um wednesday may 25th pete kohler and his wife may ling will be on the show should be interesting uh she's a guitar tech um this that should be cool may 20 uh Wednesday, June 1st, my dude, he's in my new film. This is a great guy. I'm telling you, this is going to be great. Laser Lloyd's on the show. And then we just announced this Wednesday, June 15th, ruler of hell, swallower of souls, creative rock and roll. We will have Satan on the show to talk about his career and uh, what's going on with him. You know, should be interesting. Uh, Satan, a lot to talk about. Uh, so we're looking forward to the show having our old friend Satan on as well. I uh, want to mention, of course, uh, this Saturday, if you are in New York City, I know a lot of people are traveling for this. Of course, <coughs> the Black and Blue Productions presents this Saturday, April 23rd, in our beloved Tompkins Square Park, the Capturers, Crow Mags, JM, Burn, Wisdom in Chains, Murphy's Law, and Madball. That's going down this Saturday, and the weather is looking good. So no excuses, no excuses on that one. Um, also, want to mention that on Saturday, May fourteenth, I am host. I am. I am hosting. I am moderating. Excuse me. I am moderating the Nancy Burrell. I am not holding your coat book event at Generation Records. There will be an acoustic set by Kate 108. Come on through. This is the same day as the bowl, but this is happening early. Uh, actually, this is the wrong flyer. It's happening at five o'clock. It's happening at five, uh, excuse me, one o'clock in the afternoon from one to three. So come by. Uh, this is going to be cool at, at, at Generation Records. Um, that said, I want to bring a friend of ours on the show talking about he comes on from now and then. He comes on now and then. Of course, Devin from DTFM Vinyl Distro. What's up, bro? What's up, Drew? <laughs> How are you? I am good. Other than the crappy weather outside. It's like hot outside now. Wait a second. Crappy weather in Fargo, North Dakota? I know, right? Hard to believe. I find that hard to believe. It's it's scary. It really is. That's cool. Hey, did you um, did you bring some records for us? I did. And hey, uh, before before you do anything, you know what? Let's do this. Let's bring our guest, a hey, Doug. Let's bring oh! Doug and let's let's bring Sid on. So so this way we can all be a part of what what do you got? What's happening? What's the latest? What's coming? What's coming through the distro? Uh, all right, all right. Surprise us. Okay, Doug. Sorry you didn't play on this record. But since you were in the Descendants, I had to bring up this one, Ninth and Walnut. This is like Phenomenal. my second favorite record from last year. I don't even know what year. that is. What is oh, that, though? The new Descendants record. Oh, the okay. brand new Descendants record? It's like the old new one. It's all stuff that like uh... – did you have a hand in writing some of this? No, but I have a story. Do you want to hear it? Please. Yes, please. I do. Okay, so – Hey, wait, wait. Devin, hold up the cover again. I want to see it. Yes. Okay. Let me see the cover. Okay. 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 <laughs> All right. Go ahead, Doug. I got it. Got it. Sorry, because I know you're you're doing the record thing, but just no, no, so you, no, no, just because no, you brought good. one out of the box. No, this so, is good. This is fine. Here's go ahead. here's here's what the story is, and and, and I'm gonna go with like <laughs> with love. Okay. So Descendants, they wrote a crop of songs, and Bill can tell you this, and this is straight from Bill to me. Like he told me exactly what this is. Descendants wrote a crop of songs. And then the second crop of songs was Milo Goes to College. Okay. So when Doug was a teeny bopper, when I went to go see them, I saw them before Milo Goes to College. So that, that record, like Crepe Suzette and all those things, I haven't heard those songs since I had heard, since I saw them at the barn. What's freaking amazing is, Two things. Bill had recorded some of the stuff before Frank had passed away. La, 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 la. And then when COVID hit, 
they were trying to figure out like, and you should have those ninjas talk about it, but they were like, well, shit, now's a great time to do these vocals. Cause there was downtime and the band wasn't going to be playing. And that's how that came about. But what's badass about it is the song. And I I'm assuming Devin, you've listened to it all the way down. I love it. I okay. love that album so, so much. That record, like the way the song, like the way I know, like the way I know there's a song on there that, I hadn't heard the melody since I was freaking 15. And the moment I heard it, I was like, holy shit, I know that song. <laughs> Whatever. There you go. So shout That's out cool. to them for freaking releasing the first batch of songs. And it's absolutely on point. And you go, yep, that's yeah. why they're one of the best bands at that punk chainsaw pop thing. Enough for and me. That's, back- that's, that's, that's- Devin, that's vinyl. That's a twelve. That's twelve inch vinyl. That's a twelve inch vinyl. That is the limited edition on green. Ooh. Ooh. So All I right. Don't know if they make those anymore. I I know where you're going with this, and I like it. What do you got next? <laughs> All right. Next one I got is Full of Hell, Garden of Burning Apparitions. These guys are like, I wouldn't say I'm the biggest fan, but I really respect what they do. Uh, this is on like 250 red, so it's also limited edition. But they always push the boundaries of what like hardcore can be. Like they always throw in some industrial elements. Uh, they played this as hardcore a lot. Hmm. And if you go back to their early stuff, it's definitely more grindy. But this new record definitely kind of got more of that Nine Inch Nails sort of feel. And again, not that it's... I wouldn't say that it's bad, but it's definitely more for people who are into the avant-garde stuff. So, fair warning. Makes sense. <laughs> um, what else? Um, what else you got? Classic right here. Ooh, yeah. Ooh. Oh yeah. Ooh. Ooh. I know a lot of people say "Out Come the Wolves," but for me, it's it's the no. It's, a, it's really that first record that sets off that band, even though they had a seven. Did you, Sid? Band. You're a big fan of this band, right? I should be. I was in one of their videos in on the on the second record. Okay. Hey, I was a star even back then. Everybody's a star, baby. Like Sly Stone said, everybody's five a star. Minutes. Uh, what else, Devin? I got one last one here. Check this baby out. I can't believe I have one left. Ooh, wow. Yeah. That that record is severe, man. That's a severe record. Ooh. I know that record. It's a destroyer. Mother. You know, they Andrew, played. I already told they, you about I the uh, biohazard the, incident. I saw one of the shows that they played. They only played a couple of shows. I saw really? them play once. Yeah. In, in 94? I saw them play. Yeah. Yeah. Here's a question. Here's a question, and, and I guess, I guess, uh, Doug, you, uh, Devin, you could, you can answer this one first. But De- how does Devin feel about the current wait times with vinyl? I'm hearing as short as eight months and as long as 15 months. The wife and I have about five records on order that are not going to be available till probably next year because of it. It is killing me. It is mm. killing me because there's people who have stuff on request. I have to tell them it's like ah. Uh, yeah, you're probably not going to see that for five months. And even if you pre-order it from the band, you're probably not going to see it for like five or six. Special colors? Forget about it. <laughs> ah, I'm glad yeah, we got it. We got a collector. It is personally killing me. I have a, what is it? Hot Water Music's new album on vinyl coming in the mail. When? I don't know. And isn't, isn't a, a record store day net this coming Saturday too, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So of course everyone, like certain collectors are like throwing fits over. Doug, you got any perspective on that? I have all kinds of perspectives on it. It's, it freaking sucks because, um, back in the dinosaur day, like (laughs) back in the dinosaur day, you could get a vinyl turned around pretty quick, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks. You know, and this is and I'm going back to like in the era of like when Milo goes to college came out like way back. You could get shit turned around really fast. Now, dot, 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 moving into 2022, 150 years later, like for field day, our issue is like we would like to be able to release music every six months. But even if I can turn in music that fast, I can't get the turnaround at the pressing plants. Right. So it is a 
bitch. It sucks. Then, then there's another, another thing to that. Sorry to nerd out, but there's another thing, which okay. is um, when you have bigger artists like Coldplay or Adele or wonderful oh, artists, uh, Taylor Swift or whatever it is, they're, they basically – take all the oxygen and uh, out of the pressing plants, the people that are making the records and everybody goes to the back of the line because oh, there's such yeah. big orders. So it double sucks. So if you're, if yeah. you're a small indie band and you want to do a thousand records, 1500 records, whatever it is, you're, you're easily, easily in a 14 month. That's a possible window for you. 14 months. Let, let me, let me throw this out there, which, you know, and, and, and I'm not, I'm a little bit of a, they say I'm a little bit of a novice when, when it comes to this end of the business, but yeah, I know, I know we, we put a seven inch out. We got on it early, you know, before, just as the pandemic hit, we recorded it. We got it out and, and we saw the avalanche coming and we kind of, we got, but I, excuse me for thinking that if the, it's a world of supply and demand, mm -hmm. if there's so much demand for vinyl, why aren't there more printing places, uh, pressing places opening up or, or is that equipment, like somewhat like archaic at this point and hard to come by. Yeah. So what ended up, I, I, I'll take this one. So Please. what ended up, what ended up happening was a lot of the, when vinyl went out of phase and every, all those manufacturers went into the CD business and they, I they, see. they got rid of their big giant machines. And so um, like anything, those machines are, not the easiest to come by and they require maintenance. And so some of one of the big manufacturing companies was called United and United was based out of Nashville. And uh -huh. when United couldn't hold on anymore and they, the family went into the CD business, they sold the stuff to Jack White. So the pressing. Oh, that's right. I heard about so that. So that's right. where that gear goes. So in a, in a way you're talking about like, um, it's just not the easiest it's not just, it's like, it's almost like trying to get auto parts for a really old car. It's like, you got to have that shit custom made that they don't, you can't yeah. just find that stuff anymore. It's very you know, different. So it, the, yeah. the big question is when Warner brothers let go of theirs and capital let go of theirs, sure. they, used to, they used to do a lot of their manufacturing at rainbow in Santa Monica, which was another really big pressing plant. Sure. Rainbow couldn't hold on and they got rid of it. So the, the, the issue is, um, Oh, it's just a phase. It's just a fad. Blah 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 blah. So the Warner Brothers and the Capitol Records of the world, they probably don't want to invest in right. that kind of um, infrastructure at this point. I would imagine it is, that it is sort of issue. interesting that that things have come around again. You know, and and I remember I'm going back, I'm going back years, fifteen, whatever. When when I was when when. Um, when I was raising a kid in Vermont and there was, we lived in a small town and there was, there was a main street and there was that one mom and pop record store. And we used to go behind the record store and there was stacks and stacks and stacks of boxes, box, boxes of records that they were just throwing away. Oh, and geez. we, we would, we would get, we'd grab some records and bring them home. And his, you know, his mother, my significant other at the time, would paint on them, and it was funny. And I would, I, at one point, I explained to the kid these used to play music. No, yeah, mommy, mommy paints on these, but right. they used to play these. This is music, and he's, you know, and and then what? I remember having this really interesting conversation with him, and what happened after that? And I said CD, and what before that? And I said this radio is <laughs> interesting, right. but. But you know, records have records have, have come back around, and I guess the infrastructure is not there to handle the supply these days. And, and I don't think that they're. Go I, I don't think the larger labels are going to jump into that because the sales aren't there. So exactly. Right. Again, you, you know, we're all let's say over twenty five, so we know that like when a record back in the dinosaur day, let's say you're talking about um, an Aerosmith record or or a Michael Jackson Thriller. Or something sure. like that, you know, yeah. those records sold millions of millions, records, millions of mofo records, ACDC, yeah. millions, back of millions. black, millions of records. Right now, the way the sales are, because things have been split so far apart in that, like monetizing records, whether you're talking about streaming or pirating or the different formats, that format, I don't think the larger, there aren't enough sales 
to yield a capital record saying, yes, we're going to invest X point X million dollars into buying and being able to press. So who is keeping it alive are hardcore people and punk people. Like that's who's do that's who freaking kept that shit alive. And I think that that no disrespect to the bands in that world, as much as the sales are like, if you can sell 10,000 records these days, uh, Devin, you would know, right? Like a record when you were a kid and you heard, Milo goes to college. When Milo goes to college came out, that sold 2000 records. That was an out of body experience. When we, when meat puppets uh, up on the sun sold 33,000 records, we were like, that's, that's the highest we had ever heard of a punk record or an right. SST right. record ever selling. Now, then things got really big and you have again, thriller and blah, 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 blah. Now Nirvana. Now um, I don't know when even bands that are like, big i don't know how many records they're actually selling you know when you see are, are they selling like ten thousand records a lot like, of it is going to streaming now because that's how people get their music is digitally true, true. And, and 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 you know what to, to put a button in that i i think that that's badass but there's something about people holding a physical record and looking at the picture and the liner sure, notes and sure. and yes it might be this archaic like sure. oh you mean that's a typewriter this old thing but i think that when people hold on to it they, it, it creates a little bit more value and you have more of a personal bond with that piece of art if you will where i think when you're when it's streaming you're just like i'm on to the next one i'm on to the next one it's different well, it's sort of like when CDs first came out and people were just like oh i'm just gonna skip to song five Ooh, number seven Ooh, before uh you know we, we've, I we've talked someone first telling me you got to listen to the whole album to get the experience mm -hmm. we've talked about this many many times about how you know, back, you know, and, and I'm not trying to pull some like, you know, back in the day, you know, because I, I can't stand that kind of stuff. But records and record release and record art was a big part of the community and the culture back then. And we would go to the record store on Tuesday because that's where the new releases were. And you would just pick up the records and you would just look at the art and, and read who produced it. And like all this information was such a big part of of of, of the of the music and when when you know vinyl went away or, or whatever when when things went streaming that's just a, a, a part of it that's gone now is, is you know who produced it what's going the art you know look at look, you know you open up the wow the gate for wow look at all you know like i i mean i i spent a good part of my youth staring at the inside of leonard skinnerd one more from the road the inside of the allman brothers band brother of of uh, eat a peach you know, the, 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 the incredible art in these records, you know, which you just, you just don't, you just don't get anymore. You know, nope, that's a, that's a, it's a giant subject and you're, and the ones that are killing it are killing it and doing it well. And I do believe, well, I'm going to go on this. Thank you to everybody that's picked up a field day record. Thank yeah. you. That totally freaking rocks. And we're happy to be doing it. And we really try to put out, great music and with great packaging. So shout out to Simon for helping us on the graphics side and shout out to um, all the people that really like, they, they buy vinyl and they're like, they're into it. It's totally badass. Hey, Sid, Sid, I want to thank you for popping on. Devin, you're a great sponsor and I'm very fortunate to have you behind this show. I want to thank you very much. Always great right. to be here, Drew. Thank you, Drew. Okay, I'll see, I'll see you later, Sid. And, and, and Devin, uh, by the way, how's the weather in, in Fargo, North Dakota right now? Well, you ever seen The Empire Strikes Back? <laughs> yes. Really? It's like that still, huh? Yes, it's still like that. Spring will not spring. <laughs> there you go. All right, Devin, I'll talk to you later. Later, dude. Ciao. Yeah, that was, that, that, that was cool. And uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah I got, we got, I'm fortunate to have good spots. I want to shout out. Uh, my neighbor, Brett, the bookie. Yes. The peanut butter and jelly sandwich in, in, in Jefferson airplane volunteers. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about Dag Nasty and, 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 and uh, we pull out some of the notes um, okay. in 19, uh, I guess in, in 86, 87, you moved to, you moved to Washington, DC. Mm -hmm. And then I'm assuming you fell in with these guys, but why did you move to Washington, DC? Well, I moved to Washington, D.C. because 
Baker wanted to reboot Dag Nasty. Oh, so you were, you were in communication with him before you made the move? Right. So here's how he, here's what had happened. I'm in Descendants, and Descendants are playing nine, the old 930 club. Mm-hmm. And that's the first time I went through there when I had met Ian. Okay. Mm-hmm. The second time Descendants go through to play 930 club, um, we're on, uh, uh, on the bill is Brian's band, Dag Nasty, with Sean Brown. Uh, so yeah, I got Sean, to- Sean Brown was the original singer with the original dude, the and original, so, the original dude who actually, when they got back together the last time was singing for them. Totally. Kapish. Got it. So, so, so far, so good. So when, and, and I, again, I was familiar, Hey, what's going on? I'm Doug and yep. whatever. A little bit of time goes by and descendants were getting ready to do a bunch of shows up by the Buffalo, Canada, Toronto, la 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 up that way. And Dag came back and Dag Nasty came out. And this time Brian had Dave Smalley. So my understanding is that Dave only did a maybe less than 10 shows, eight shows live, eight shows live, something like that. That's and I, I, yeah, not very many. And I saw the bulk of them because I descendants and Dag was a package going through um, uh, that time. No, no, Rick, Dave Smalley was not the first singer for Dag Nasty. Correct. He, he was, was not. Second. He was the, he was second. the second. I even, Yes, I yes. So, so we do the shows, and again, I'm friendly with Brian. Hey, what's up? Blah, 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 blah. They kind of bail, and now Descendants are going to go back out again that summer. So you figure it's the summer of '86, and this time Descendants and Dagnasty are going to package, and Dagnasty is going to do maybe 30 of the shows. Descendants are out for like 90 days, 120 days. Um, <laughs> 90 yeah, I mean, days. <laughs> oh, is that good or bad? Days. Is that good or bad? No, it's incredible how, yeah. how bands like the Descendants were just, we're going yeah. out for 90 days. Yeah, yeah, those were long. Those were gnarly. Um, so long story long, this time we're at whatever, getting ready to do a show, and Brian then brings Peter Kortner. So I got to see all three Dag singers while I was in Descendants. And wow. then as that tour came to a close, Brian, you know, Brian wasn't really sure whether he wanted to keep going, whether he wanted to park it, blah, 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 blah. And we, and I was like, look, you know, I'm probably going to step off the descendants train, come to Los Angeles. We'll hang out. Maybe we can jam and have some Mexican food. And that's kind of how that started. Uh, He came out to Los Angeles. And then by the time his California West coast vacation came to a close, he was like, dude, I'm going back to DC and I'm going to reboot Dag Nasty. And so we kind of started writing songs for wig out at, um, in Hermosa beach and went well, back we, to DC. Okay. So uh, of course, so which leads us to this, which is this, dare I say, I hate to use the word iconic, but, mm-hmm. uh, which w- wig out, wig out was first you played on and then field day was after that. Mm-hmm. Right. Yes. Give us a, give us a little perspective on, on recording wig out and, 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 and how you feel about it looking back now. Um, well, so the bulk of the record was written in Hermosa beach. And I think Brian had maybe three tracks already kind of mapped out that maybe even he had demoed with Peter and was like, I got these. And then we had to write a bunch. So, uh, at the beach we had done, um, exercise Godfather, um, Couple, couple, couple few. I think the dag, the actual song "Dag Nasty" were all written there. We got a Dankos written there, um, and we went back to DC, and it was the winter time, and we started showing Colin and Peter the songs and started doing pre-production. And so by about March, we went into Inner Ear with Ian and started tracking, um, and that kind of it moved very fast. Just like back then, you didn't have a ton of time to. Um, you know, punk bands really didn't need to spend that much time doing a record. And so you spent most of your time kind of like rehearsing. Was, was, was inner ear a contemporary studio at that point? Were they, were, basement. No, I, I, I never, I never got that. I mean, I basement. always, yeah. It was a basement studio. It was almost like a guy who it was at his house and like in the basement and like, there was yep. like a, you know, kids toys and a washing machine and that kind of stuff. Wow. Uh, wow. So it was by no means would it be like, let's say, like a traditional facility, you know, 
you know, compass or one of those places, you know, capital a, you know, something like that. So just like a, a guy that was doing stuff in his basement, which was cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dam- Damien says based on wig out sounds like it's played with an incredibly thin pick. Yeah. I probably would have been playing like 73s Dunlap 73s, which was usually about then. Um, and I switch back and forth, uh, I, I'm known to be kind of a bit, a bit ham fisted. And so if I play with a one millimeter pick, I usually break strings where wow. this, if I played with a 66, I would tear up the cuticles. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so 73 seemed to be just yeah. enough. It's just it's enough. A, bite. It's, your sweet, it's your sweet spot but for that, for that era, for that era. Now, um, you know, it, was wig out at Dentos about tripping out? Was it about tripping out? Um, I think maybe Denkos, that's a Peter question, but Denkos was basically like a party house where everybody would go and hang out. Okay. And so it's, it's definitely about uh, finding your oats in the drug culture or uh, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I guess it's like I a, guess it was like the frat house. Like you'd have to ask Peter, but it was like, that's the what first, I always sort of, sort of like just the frat well, house. Like, you know, we're rigging. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I grabbed this because, you know, um, this is the field day cassette. Right. I thought the cassette, I thought the cassette would be cool um, mm-hmm. on giant records. Mm-hmm. And um, sure. so tell us a little bit about, uh, about field day, which of course is now the moniker of the band that you're in with Peter. Right. So we do wig out at Dankos and it does pretty well. And the band decides that they're going to make the jump over to giant records. Mm-hmm. We do the jump over to Giant Records and we record the All Ages Show 7-inch. The All Ages Show 7-inch does pretty well. Um, and, and, and excuse me. I, I just want to – so the All Ages 7-inch was in between the, the, the two major releases. So we did Wig Out at Danko's and then yeah. we're, we're, we did the All Ages Show 7-inch, which was in between, and it was kind of like the lead-up to this. I see. When we did the All Ages Show 7-inch, it what we learned – quickly was that we had spent a lot of money for only a few tracks. Oof. And so I was a yeah. little bit nervous. Yeah. Um, and I had remembered reading an interview uh, in Rolling Stone or spin with love and rockets and love and rockets was talking about recording in a smaller studio, but this way you had longer, a little bit more time. Sure. And so by this time the band had relocated to Hermosa beach. So we were all living on the West coast in Hermosa. Oh, wow. I think, he, I think Brian was in Venice and Peter was in Hollywood or whatever. Um, and we recorded it at a, a place called inner ear, which or, uh, at Pendragon, but it was Pendragon was kind of in the same complex where Don Dawkin had his studio. So it was a was small, that, where was that? Was that in Venice? Where was that? It was in Redondo beach, California. Redondo, Redondo. So it was in Redondo on Meyer lane. And I met the guys at the studio and, and they had kind of like, okay gear. And it was like a one inch 16 track, one inch, and um, the plan was we were going to rehearse in the rehearsal room, which was in the same building. Uh, and we did probably about 30 rehearsals back to back kind of pre-production. And sure. then we just wheeled the gear down, down into the recording studio side and just laid into, laid into tracking. Uh, and that is how kind of how the, the field day record came about. And that's it. Uh- I know, uh, and, and and I'm 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 quoting, and I'm I'm, I'm quoting you, quoting a, a friend of mine that I've known a long time, Mike Gitter, mm-hmm. and you say I seem to remember Mike Gitter telling me back then that it was like Dag Nasty trying to make an REM album with Field Day. Yes, uh, that's okay. I, yeah, I, so, yeah, sure. So, I mean, I mean so, but let me just ask: was 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 that brought on by the label, or was it something that was? No, is that something you guys were going in or that direction? Uh, I mean, I mean, I, I know, I know, I know Brian. I know Brian at one point was asked to join REM in some capacity. Right. You know, so, la- later, later on. But so REM was a big influence. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, so th- the answer to your question is, did, did Giant have anything to do with that? No. Um, okay. There was really maybe two, two things came about. One of them was the guys in the band were really good and could play just about anything. We could play jazz. We could play punk. That's awesome. We could play kind of salsa, anything. Uh, remember before where I was talking about like B 
being an experimental kind of guy. And I could have just as easily been a guy that like sure. rubbed pieces of metal together. Sure. Uh, sure. I am in it for the art. Yeah. Uh, there is a certain amount, sometimes even to my own detriment, <laughs> I, yeah. I can raise my hand and be like, sometimes that's not the right decision, but it's like, I'm into it for the art. Uh, nobody forced the band to do anything. When okay. we were in there rocking and doing the pre-production, that's what we were playing. Those are the songs like, oh, wow. What if we did one that was more like this? Oh, wow. What if we did one that was more like this? What if we did sure. one? And that, that's what the record was. Um, I guess in a certain regard, it's safe to say, looking at that era and that time frame, we were all products of our environment and what, what, what was going on and what was out there at that time. You know, A thousand percent. Also, yeah. I, I think if you, around the same time, bands were really making the, some of them were really making a deliberate shift into the metal world. Hello. Like, you know Hello. what I mean? Really, yes. So we, um, we just were making, uh, I guess you could say making a shift. A lot of people don't know. Some people do know at that. You see, I'm wearing a Smith's shirt. So I was really locking into what could be done on guitar and what could be done on guitar, um, against a very straight bass line. Um, and that's really what that is. That's really what that is, is, is not being, um, we were at a spot where we, not only were we not very ham fisted, we could play, but yeah. we also were, um, trying to spread our, our wings a bit to see what we were capable of sure. at the time. And well, now, that's an, well, that's an exciting place to be. Yeah, it's an exciting place to be. It, yeah, you know why? Because your records now, like sometimes, you know, before, you know, you're talking about like things having to have a niche or a market or whatever. I think that we were just trying to do our own record. Like these are the songs yeah. we're writing. There is really no gigantic career path, if you will. Let's just write some songs and here's where we are. What's amazing is as the record came out, people did not like the record at all. We had, we had stretched them wings so far that it kind of bummed people out. But mm. in Europe, the record did very well. And it, it, was, <laughs> it, did, it did really well. And there's a lot of people that the F Green Field Day record is their entry record into, like, into DAG. And they went from there to Wig Out, from Wig Out to Can I Say. Um, so that's kind of how that, you know, that, that, I, it's funny because... I'd say often people ask me, dude, when are you going to remaster that record and re-release it? And, you know, it just kind of, it's one of these records that people lo love. Then it's also a record that sometimes people hate. Um, it's, it seems like, but, but that said, it seems like a record that's aged well. And in perspective, you know, looking back, a lot of people, uh, you know, uh, love that record. Uh, John Mead says, hence covering Rude Boys and Wire. Yes. Yeah. There you go. Like, yeah, just yeah. Do, like, just that's kind of the deal was, was yeah. we're just doing our, like when, when nobody's telling you what to draw and they just hand you crayons and paint and a blank canvas mm -hmm. and you have no, like, we, we didn't want to, we didn't want to do what anybody else was doing. We wanted to do what we were doing. Sure. <laughs> so we just, we wrote a record Oh, uh, you know, for whatever it's worth, um, we wrote a record and, and that was the record we turned in. And it was, it was a freaking talk about an exploration and a voyage into the unknown. That's what that was. Here's a great shot of you guys from city gardens. You remember playing that place? Sure. Played there a bunch of times, a gazillion times. Look at me high flying. Yeah. With the, you, you, with the really, with, yeah. It's a in great, boots. great, Great uh, Ken Salerno. Uh, yes, yeah. yes, Gina. What's up, Gina? Uh, women of the Pit. Um, yeah, City Gardens, New Jersey represent, you know? And, and, and you see that I'm wearing glasses there? Yeah. yeah. I'm wearing what they, what in the in the dinosaur day, they called them schoolboys, so they were just clear glasses. But I'm right. wearing them because that's how much of a Smiths fan I was. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Just a total dork. <laughs> We were big. Smiths, Smiths were big in our world then. I loved yeah. them. I thought they were great. I thought they were great, great songwriters, great guitar playing, incredible guitar playing. That's great. That's great. Um, so, all right. So, I mean, and, and there's a couple of things I, I, want, 
I want to get to. So we're sort of hopping sure. around a little sure. bit. But um, the dag nasty, the dag nasty hand um, plays out. Um, you, and you had, I mean, it sounds like you had a really uh, nice uh, run with them, mm -hmm. you, you know, um, I know it's a couple years later, but you end up in for love, not Lisa, right? Right. So, and this ties to the field day record. Okay. Watch, watch Cause this. I'm wondering like, what's the connection here? Oh, okay. So, so here's the, here's the connection and I'll, I'll, I'll tie oh, Wait, Before together. we go there. Mm -hmm. Favorite Smith song. Um, maybe shoplifters. Cool. You know what I mean? Maybe shoplifters. Uh, shoplifters was the one that like, that was the one that convinced Peter to jump in. Yeah. I don't know. Fair enough. Great, Fair great. enough. You know, I, I always leaned in on the guitar playing and I think. Yeah. Well, Johnny Marr, right? Freaking phenomenal guitar playing. Like, wow. Next level. What? Like you could do all that on a stringed instrument. Amazing. So yeah. amazing. So, um, so we're to, now we're going in the early nineties. We're in the early nineties yeah. and I think we're, it's 1991, 1992, something like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm living in Los Angeles and I had gotten more and more into the production side of things. And I was working with Matt Hyde and Matt. Now here again, it's a little bit of a nerdy story, but here you go. So Matt was working at crystal studio and crystal studio is where like, the Jackson five recorded and fricking um, just a ton, like a ton of bands. And what was unique about crystal was that Andrew Berliner made his board. So the, it was a custom crystal studios board, one of a kind. That's how that, like, I think super tramp breakfast for America was recorded on that board, like pretty heavyweight, heavyweight records. Anyway, Maddie worked in the B room. And every once in a while, he would track in the A room and had done, Matt did um, all kinds of records, but probably the most popular would be maybe Porno for Pyros, mm -hmm. you know, doing that record, whatever. Matt Hyde. So, so Matt is a great guy. And, and I was kind of like, um, I would, if you want to call it, maybe his assistant is the right word. And I would come and hang out and help him track bands and in a way set the vibe. Okay. So he was getting ready. Matt was getting ready to do a record for a band called for love, not Lisa. And he's like, yeah, do you want to drive down to the South Bay with me? I've got to go see this band called for love, not Lisa. Great. So we jump in the car, we jump in his truck and we're driving down. And as we're pulling into the parking lot, I'm like, Matt, this is where we recorded the Dag Nasty record field mm. day. And he's like, really? So we go into the rehearsal room. It's the same freaking building. And for love, not Lisa guys are just, totally blown away they're like holy shit you played on that record that record was recorded here and mm -hmm. and i was like yeah like look on the liner notes it's right there um long story long matt ends up getting the gig he wants to bring me in tow i think they were doing the record on east west the bass player that they had had um he was an okay bass player, but there were times where they would say to me, Doug, how would you hit this? And I'd pick up the bass and be like, dee -da -dee -da -dee -da -dee -da -dee 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 and play it. And then, you know, they kind of looked at Matt and looked at me and looked at their bass player and looked at Matt and looked at me. And they were like, you know, dude, we're going to have Doug play bass on this record. Uh, and they're like, would you do that? And I was like, okay. And that's how that happened. Like all of a sudden I had gone in there and they're like, you know, what, what's your take on this? What's your take on that? What's your take on this? And I just started playing. I, just, I, I went in, I went in wearing one hat and ended up wearing a different hat. And the hat was like played based on that record. You, are you on mute? I'm sorry. Okay. Was it a little, was it a little awkward? Um, that transpiring right in front of the base, the bass player that they had. Yeah, it was a little because I've was. been in that. I've seen that situation multiple times. Yeah, I've like been was. in the room with that, and it's sort of like, or like, you know what, dude, the guitar player is going to play bass on this record, or it, the producer is going to play bass, or, or so and so is going to come in and play drums. There's always that sort of like, ooh, you know. Yeah. So I, I think that the guy, the guy, I can't even remember his name, was pretty cool about it. But the, the reality is, like, um. 
it, I, I'm going to give, uh, we're, we'll go back to like a, a, a Brian Baker slash bad religion quote where it's like fastest driver drives in situations like that. Yeah. It's that, just well, like, well who's the dude? Who's the dude? Yeah. And it was like, yeah. I, I wasn't gunning for the base spot at all. Right. That's, that's sure. like, that's not my style. Which one the like, hand called for. And, and Maddie would just be like, Doug, you're in. I, I am. Uh, you know, so it was more like that fastest driver drives. But you ended so, up in the band for a couple of years, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So once that dude left, once, once the bass player left and I played on it, it just, then they were like, well, what are you doing live? And I was like, yeah, I could, I could do some shows with you guys. And then their management company, they kind of wanted me, the man, what's funny is the management company wanted me to be in the project and to work with them because they'd never really toured before. Right. So I was kind of brought on in a way to be like the, the uh, I'm not going to say chaperone, but I was like the bass player slash well, the, guy with the, the guy that has a little, the, the guy that's got a couple, some mileage on him. Yeah. So, so um, that was it. Long story long. That was how that went down. And we did a bunch of shows. And um, unfortunately that band didn't really, it didn't really, get a, a ton of traction like okay um played all kinds of just played all kinds of shows all over the place well one thing one thing that i remember you guys were on was was this soundtrack which which was you know i i correct me if i'm wrong but i mean of that era this was like one of the big soundtracks of that era i mean I got. A, I have a Judgment Night soundtrack here that you know because uh, I was involved with Biohazard at that point. Mm -hmm. And it, to me, I think back, it's like the Crow soundtrack was huge. Uh, mm -hmm. Judgment Night, um, the Beavis and Butthead soundtrack. Could you lend us any perspective on sort of that soundtrack era? So I don't really know a ton about uh, other than like this was such a big deal for me because being on a compilation where. Um, that had the cure. Oh yeah, the cure was the lead off track, right? Fuck, dude. Come on, yeah. man. Come on. So, I think that for you know, for there was a time where um soundtracks not only were they a great way to promote a band and a great way to promote a movie and music, you know, that we were we had long since gone away from the um uh uh film score score era and they were kind of like starting to license tracks and throw tracks in because it was a way to connect youth sure. culture to the film sure sorry to be dorky about it but that's kind of what that was so yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of times record labels would take on a soundtrack because one it was a way to move product they could sell them they could okay. license it and and it just kind of it, it lent itself to um a great snapshot of what was going on musically at that time. And that's, that's that. Yeah. I'll, 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 I'll buy that a hundred percent. And it's interesting. Cause you know, I'm not, did this record go gold? I, I think it, it might, it did. Right. Yeah. It's huge. And, it's and, and huge. Yeah. It was, I think, yeah. It, I mean, these records were huge. This record, the judgment night record, the Beavis, huge. these records all went gold and platinum and, Look at this line, you know, The Cure, Stone Temple Pirates, Nine Inch Nails, Rage, uh -huh. uh, um, Rollins Band, Helmet, uh -huh. Pantera, uh -huh. For Love Not Lisa. I know. mean, this, sh this shouldn't Jesus be- Jesus and Mary Chain. And I love at the bottom, at the bottom, it's like James Cyberry. I'm like, huh? Who? Yeah. <laughs> you know, this isn't anything new because you remember when you would make mixed cassettes when you were a sure. kid and you had cassettes sure. with compilations yeah, yeah. and shit like that. Yeah, so- yeah. Uh, I guess you could say this is the same as like KTEL presents and it's like, yeah, yeah. you know, the top of the pops or whatever, but yeah. this was a legit body of music, a mix of music from that time. And who wouldn't like, you could listen top to bottom and be like, Oh wow, this is what's sure. going on. If you put that CD in a space capsule and shot it out into space and the aliens mm -hmm. found it, they'd be like, Oh, this is what was happening in whatever 1990. When did that come out? Sure. 90. Yeah, yeah. 94? Is that right? I'd have to look. Um, so 93, 94? Anyway. Yeah. You know, you, when, when a band like For Love Not Lisa was in a recording studio in, in that sort of era, mm -hmm. was did the word come down, whether it was from management or label, like, hey, um, 
we're going to need a track or two or three beyond the record to, to in case of something like this? Or do you just go in and do what you're going to do? You just go in and do what you're going to do. What's a little bit different about what's a little bit different about that particular band was, um, do you remember before where I was talking about how Dagnasty went in to record or Descendants would go in and, and record Black Flag style or Nirvana Bleach style where you just go Black Sabbath, that first Black Sabbath record where it's like 12 hours. They're like, we're in, we're out, we're going. <laughs> you know, that's that was the approach that like for me, that's how I go about recordings where I think it's all in the rehearsal room. Um there are bands that do records where they're writing in the studio. I don't necessarily lean into that world so much. I, it seems very, um, it seems like that's very expensive. This particular band, they were, they had some great songs, but they, um, for love, not Lisa, they took forever to record forever. And that was something where, um, it wasn't my decision. It wasn't my decision, but had I been in the driver's seat of the band, I would have said, hold off on recording. Everybody go back to the rehearsal room for 30 days and then come back. Yeah. So they had, it was a challenge for them to get through one track in a day would have been considered like, dude, where, um, you know, I'm used to like, you know, you can you when you're tracking the, the process of tracking drums like you can knock that out fast fast if the band's well rehearsed fast uh so that's really the difference was they were spending a ton of money and they were moving at a glacial pace like really yeah. slow really slow scary and it's, slow. and it's and it's all uh, it's all on the clock and it's all it's all recoupable <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and so i think that one of what you know the marketing department probably realized like oh we're in x amount of dollars on this record let's try to get for love not lisa on this crow soundtrack to try I to see. get him a little bit more heat and so that's like that's a I marketing see. thing <laughs> that makes sense. yeah yeah so hey let's let me take my last uh sponsor sure. break we'll do a couple shout out we'll do you know, take care of some business and we'll come back and, and let's talk a little about field day we'll take some questions from around the world okay ooh, ooh, ooh. That's right. You asked for it, you got it. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live, and we are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill, The Texas Silver Rush, Chain Reaction Records and Skateboards, DTFM Vinyl Distro, Chacho's Tacos, 126 Hardcore Clothing, and since 1992, Generation Records has been a mainstay of the New York metropolitan area music scene. Today, they offer a diverse selection of new and used rock, jazz, indie, hip-hop, punk, hardcore metal, blues soundtrack, and reggae LPs, as well as T-shirts, posters, and other merchandise. They buy used record collections and music memorabilia and will pay you top dollar for them. House calls made for large collections in the tri-state area. Call or email generationrecords at gmail.com. Follow them on Facebook and on Instagram. Come on now. Chacho's Tacos. Located in Corpus Christi, Texas, Chacho's Tacos opened their doors in 2001. Home of the almighty. Almighty Chacho's Taco. They cook up an incredible homestyle Tex Mex food, and this month they're celebrating their 20th anniversary. They've been supporting underground music since the beginning, in their own words, we ain't stopping anytime soon. Touring bands that play Corpus Christi swing by and get a home cooked meal at Chacho's Tacos, we got you. The underground scene will never die. Please follow us on Facebook and on Instagram. Also, I want to shout out our friends at Grunge and Grime Soap Company, who are probably coming on as a sponsor in the future. Um, www.grungeandgrime.com. Get some, get some good soap, you punk rock dirt bag. Wash that ass. Uh, that said, um, oh yeah, no intro music. I fucked it up. You know, I always try, it's always try to remember the intro music. I messed it up. Hold on, let me see what my what the selection is here. Night driving, Grunge and Grime Soap Company. <laughs> I don't know. How about into space? Feeding the ducks. All right. Yeah, I got, I got to get my background music. Here, I'll get some background music for this. Here. Um, by the way, on... Here we go. Hold on. It'll, it'll work for this. All right, all right. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hey, on... 
June 3rd, I am going to be in Berlin, Germany, signing copies of my book, uh, The New York Hardcore Chronicles, Volume 1, 1980 to 1989, at the Cortex Record Store in Berlin, Germany. So listen, all you krauts out there in Germany, make the trip, come see me, we'll hang out. Um, that should be cool. I, I am screening my new film in, does it sound like Phil Collins? Ouch. Uh, that said, you know what? Make it stop! <laughs> Good Lord, that was exhausting. Woo! You know, uh, I want to mention, and then if anybody doesn't have the book, some of the books, the third printing of the book, just came in where is where is all that where is the book the book um the book's available at www.stonefilmsnyc.com uh the new york hardcore chronicles volume one so there you go also my new film is screening in brooklyn on may 23rd there are a couple of tickets left not many i think like three quarters are sold um, Howie Abrams is moderating the Q&A with myself, my brother Evan B. Stone, and musician Gilly Yallow. That is the Jews in the Blues world premiere at the Nighthawk Cinema in Prospect Park. This is going to be a great event in the, in the big room, kids. It's in the big room. Um, check it out at the Nighthawk Cinema. There's a couple of tickets left. Jump in the game. We'd love to have you. It's going to be a great great evening. I also have to mention that the next Back to the New York Hardcore Roots music series show at the Bowery Electric is Sunday All Ages Free on May 22nd with Ludacrist, Butterbrain, Thug It, I Quit, Extinguish the Code, and Deja, DJ Spike Polite. The show is free. If it's free, it's for me. Get your ass down there. And then, of course, the one after that, which will be our incendiary device, formerly Antidote NYHC, our maiden voyage will be on August, uh, excuse me, June 26th with sewage, blackout shoppers, inhuman, first show in four years, and sworn enemy. This is going to be a banger at the Bowery Electric, free all ages, Sunday matinee. Come down. You could smoke angel dust outside with rap bones if that's what you're into. Uh, huff glue, whatever, whatever is cool and happening at the old um, Sunday matinees. I uh, want to mention also, um, if you have a question about supporting the show, uh, there is a Patreon page. Show needs your support. That's what enables this show to happen is your support. Very fortunate that there are people around the world that support the show. Um, please jump in the game. There's a Patreon page. Uh, there's a $2 tier, a $5 tier. I uh, release all kinds of stuff on Patreon. Um, free shirts. Uh, come out on the walking tour. Whatever. You know, jump in the game. Yes, Ludacrist. Um, got your tickets? Good, Hags. Glad you're coming to the screening, man. Um, but yeah. Also, uh, we're taking questions now. If you want to post up, Post up a question for Doug. Uh, there's a super chat. Uh, the super chat, uh, if you want to donate to the show, we'd appreciate it. A super chat comes through in color. I can't miss it. Sometimes, you know, I'm doing fuck. I'm doing 30 things here. The hell you what? What do you expect? So, you know, no, no, I can't handle a little dust. I'm not, no. My dust smoking days and, and glue huffing days are way over, way over. You know what I'm saying? So that said, um, I think I covered everything. Yo, oh, also, I want to shout out my Uncle Richie and Aunt Mimi um, who are going through some trying times. I love you both very much. I want to also shout out my half aunt and, and uh, my half uncle Les who are also going through some trying times. And yo, I got to shout out my significant other who doesn't like me mentioning her name or talking about her on the show, but I want to shout, I want to shout she whose name cannot be spoken on the show. So, so there you go. Um, that said, uh, did I, I mentioned everything. 
Oh, we need a, we need a name for the upcoming fest. So if anybody has any interest, and not like, yo, punk rock on the Bowery Fest, or hardcore, New York hardcore, you know, like, let's try to come up with a cool name for the fest we're about to announce. Um, Cortex signing in Berlin. I'll be there June 3rd. Bowery Electric shows May 22nd and May 26th. Black and Blue show in the park this Saturday. Ooh. Come on now. Nancy Burrell book event. I am moderating along with Women of the Pit. Hold on. Let me get my little Women of the Pit thing up there. Boom. Uh, that is at um, Generation Records on May 14th. The Patreon-only walking tour has moved to Saturday, June 7th. I want to thank all the Facebook pages that support me, uh, the new patrons, Michael, Mike Tittle, um, Fred De La Cruz, Jeffrey Stano, and, and Gina Vaccaro. Thank you for supporting the show. Uh, Hardcore Circus. That's not bad. Not bad. We already had we already had Rampage Fest. So we can't rise fest, you know. There you go. That said, let's bring our guests back on. Um, any questions, please post it up. Let me clear the deck. What the heck? Doug Carrion. Hey, buddy. Ooh, ooh, ooh. What's crap? Sorry, I had I had a lot to go through there, man. Dude, you're getting shit done. That's cool. I like it. You're a man on a mission, and you got things to do, and I can appreciate that. You know what they say? Hashtag don't hate the hustle. <laughs> I love people that hustle. Good for you. You're on your hustle. Fucking there you go. I'm, I, listen, I'm hustling, and believe me, there's plenty of people who hate my hustle, but that's okay. That, that's, 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 that's the way it is, man. I'm okay with it. It's all right. I, I learned a new one, which was, if it's free, it's for me. That's oh, a pretty yeah. good. If it's free, it's for me. <laughs> I never yeah. heard that before, but oh, there no, you go. Yeah. Um, RS70, our, 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 really our, our graffiti, our graffiti guy. Uh, what neighborhood in LA are you in? Uh, and, and let me go one step further. Did you ever write graffiti? Did you ever skateboard? Skate? Yes. It's graffiti? Yeah. No. Uh, so, um, Yes. Like I, I'm old man. So like I grew up like skateboarding in like the Tony Alva J Adams era, you know, that, that era, but I grew, there's a song called Doug rides a skateboard. That's like, I grew up on a skateboard. That's basically, um, in part like me skateboarding out in front of like the descendants rehearsal room and Bill telling me not to skate anymore. Cause he was worried I was going to break my wrist and the tour was going to get sacked. He's like, dude, you're making me nervous. Please stop skating right now. So it's just like, it's like you always see like basketball players or, or like, you know, like, uh, no, like baseball players. Like he tore his Achilles tendon playing basketball in the off season. It's like, yeah. no. You yeah. Know? And, the, and Bill was just so He's just like, dude, please stop skating. <laughs> so there you Let's go. No graffiti. Boom. And then you had asked me the other question was what, what town? I grew up in Hermosa Beach. Mm -hmm. So that's way down at the beach side. And I live in um, up by Studio City, Burbank area. I'm up that way. Right on. Right on. Mm -hmm. So let's take a couple of questions and we're going to poke. We're going to poke around. Um, mm -hmm. Chris Donnie Chris says, what about doggy style? I know there, there's a lot. But maybe we could touch on that doggy style, any perspective, memories, anything? Greatest, one of the funniest, most fascinating bands in the world. And that is how it ties to the Cottonmouth Kings. So ah, Brad X you. from Doggy Style is also Brad X from the Cottonmouth Kings. Ah. Met them at a Descendants show. We became friends. Um, when Brian was in Los Angeles on vacation, Brad didn't have any players. Brian and I wrote, helped Brad in the studio. Long, short answer. There you go. Totally great, entertaining band. Super funny. Uh, Brad X, at that time, Doggy Style would be a straight edge guy. Kind of amazing that he ended up being like one of the weed dudes of uh, the counterculture. So kind of it, it, Interesting. And, and I told you in the pre-show that I have some, some um, connection because – um, you know, I did all the urban street bike warrior films. I did like mm -hmm. nine films in seven years. And actually that's why I, I kind of pulled these out today. All these, these are all awards that, that, mm -hmm. that, um, I saw for making those films. And we used, we had Cottonmouth Kings, you know, in, in a couple, in a couple of the films and, and, yeah. and we love that. We love, we love their stuff. And you, you played on like, uh, a, like four Cottonmouth King records and, yeah. um, you, you, you were in that, you were in that camp for a couple of years yeah. or is that something that you sort of like orbited? No, I was in the camp for a couple of years. So the, the very quick version of that is 
I was in a punk band called Humble Gods with Brad X. We were on Hollywood right. Records. And, and you did the two, you did No Heroes and Humble Gods. Right. And so we're, we're, we're on tour, doing uh -huh. our tour, and we're out with the Insane Clown Posse. Oh, and come on now. now I'm we're... not kidding. I'm not kidding. And so Humble Gods, the punk band, was the first band to go out with ICP and not get just barreled off the stage. Like, we're a good punk band. I've toured so, with them. I, I've, I've toured yeah. with ICP. Great. Great guys. So the long and, and the short of it is that uh, Hollywood Records – now, uh, ICP just had a bunch of flack and they're getting dropped because there was a problem with one of the records they did that was on Disney. And how could Disney, because Hollywood Records was a subsidiary of Disney, and how could Disney put out a record with such lewd and offensive language, blah, 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 blah. So everybody was getting sacked. For, uh, Humble Gods was one of the bands that got scrapped. So while we were on that tour, Brad was looking at, the Cottonmouth Kings and Brad being a basketball guy was very tied into the hip hop culture sure. before, before, sure. before. Okay. So he had, um, in fact, his grandparents are from Red Banks. So he would go there and spend summers there and play basketball all freaking summer. Like, Red Banks. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like that way. Okay. Okay, so uh, so he was in New Jersey and Brooklyn and all that. Oh, Red, Red Bank, New Jersey. Yes. Okay, Red Bank, New Jersey. I got yes, it. Yeah. Got sorry. It. So um, I, I thought maybe I thought yeah I yeah okay I got confused because so, I was thinking Humboldt County. So. No. So <laughs> so he had like a lot of sorry. Long story long, he had a lot of relatives that lived in the East Coast, and so he would go to the East Coast and and play basketball in the summers. That's how he learned a lot about hip hop music. Long story long, while he while we're on the tour, he's looking at what ICP's doing and he's like, you know what? I think I have an idea for another project. Humble Gods gets gets um, dropped, and he has this idea to create a, a cross between Cheech and Chong and the Beastie Boys. And that's basically what was the Cottonmouth Kings. So when so he's gonna do a track act. He didn't need me to play guitar, but right. every once in a while he'd say, Hey Doug, can you play guitar on this? Hey Doug, yeah. can you play guitar on this? So like I got to record with the Cottonmouth Kings at Capitol Records Studio A playing, you know, and I'm again going That's back awesome. to the going back to the jazz thing. You go, holy shit, this is kind of rad. <laughs> so you know what? Sometimes it's rather serendipitous that I look and I go, you know what? I grabbed that stupid acoustic guitar and I pointed it forward and I didn't know where it was going to go. I just kind of led and it's taken sure. me to some pretty amazing. You know, I, I think the ah. Cottonmouth Kings. I know Cottonmouth Kings has some really rabid fans. You know, like, oh. like the insane, like the insane clown posse. You, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I, I produced the Insane Clown Posse um, chicken hunting video. Yeah, and which was I on a, Hollywood Records. Right. And I, I got a, I had a on Jive. Was that on Jive or Hollywood? It was on, it was on Jive. Thank it you. It was on Jive. And um, I had it. It was right there on my wall. And somehow somebody saw it. And I had one of these crazy juggalo kids approach me and go, yo, I'm starting an Insane Clown Posse museum. Um, would you ever sell that record? And I said, you know what? My go I'm not selling my gold records. It, it, it's not worth it. You know, I'm proud of them. I have a bunch of stuff. I'm not yeah. selling them. And then he kept making me offers and upping these offers. Right. Yeah. And finally, I just said, just, you know, just said, I, the last offer he took, I just said, look, you want to give me this amount in cash? You got it. Thinking like right. that'll make him go away. Right. And like two seconds later, he's like, okay. And like, I just took it off the wall and, and sold it to him. And it was right at the beginning of the pandemic and it was very timely, but I, how could I say no? I, right. It was a lot of money. You know? Right. I mean, they have insane, they have fans that are just like nuts. You I know I, they're, they're uh, When you talk about like hashtag don't hate the hustle, yeah. hustlers, love it. Yeah. Hustlers. Yeah. Totally. Well, like I'm, their music, don't like the music, whatever. Love the hustle. I, le like, I learned to respect them. At first, I, I thought, ass. what is this, a joke? And then, but I, I, le I learned to really respect the, what, talk, what their whole their First whole time thing. I saw them, first time I saw them, I was like, I was talking to Violent J. I was like, dude, you guys are going to be bigger than Kiss. I was like, you guys are fucking phenomenal. And he's yeah. like, ah, we just rap, Doug. You play guitar. I'm like, yeah. dude, you guys are great. Yeah. I mean, they're great. They, 
the, t- the time that I did shows with them, phenomenal. Just great. Great show. Here's, a, here's, here's one from Rick uh, Bruce, Brust. Uh, loving Duck, uh, l- loved Doug hooking up with Mikey from the Fairmounts on the Misfits. I turned into a Martian. How did that come about? Those covers are great. Th- that's you know what? That's really nice of you to say. Thank you. I appreciate that. And during the pandemic, um, I'm kind of a guy with a little bit of energy, and people <laughs> reach out to me, and they're like, "Dude, would you play bass on this, or can you do this?" And so Mikey had reached out to me, and he was like, "Would you be interested in doing this?" and I was like, of course, you know, sure. And I can just knock them out. And that's how that comes about. So shout out to Mikey. What's going on ooh, 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 up there in Canada? And something tells me, and I'm not going to spoil it, but there's a band from Hermosa Beach that starts with a P. And that particular band, they're a very popular kind of punker band, that singer from that band and Mikey and I are kind of, going around the track a little bit about doing another one of those. So we'll okay. see. I'm just saying, just saying. Good. <laughs> you, you, you know, I, I want to, before we take another question, uh, let's address uh, field day and, hmm. and, and how did this project come to be? And, 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 uh, and you know, how did this form and, and you know, what, what, what's, what's the, what's the game plan here? Okay, how did it form? So Peter and I remained friends the whole time. Peter went down an academic road and kind of stuck in that lane. And I sure. continued following my guitar headstock forward uh, like, a, like a javelin or a baton, right? Um, and in 2018, Peter and I jumped on the phone and I had been getting a couple of emails. I'm, I'm a little bit more available in social media than Peter is. He's a bit like a hermit. Uh, and some people were asking me about the wig out of Danko's record and could that material ever be done live? And so Peter and I jumped on the phone and for a minute we thought maybe Brian would do it, but Brian got into a bad religion cycle. So he was going to be out of the mix. And I had said to Peter, I was like, look, you know, if you want to do it, we could do it, but we'd have to call it a different name. And Peter was like, I love the idea, but I want to do new music. Um, and so that kind of started the conversation and by July of 20 or July, 2019, we did our first show at the black cat in Washington, DC. And that's kind of it. We just decided to bring it out, dust it off and boom, do stuff. And quickly we did it. We did about a year's worth of, we did about a year's worth of shows and then we started releasing new music and that's kind of where we are. Now, now that I think back about how our paths crossed, was mm-hmm. that th- the band that the, the band that I was in, Antidote NYHC and Field Day, we were sort we were put out by the same label in Europe, correct? Uh, is it We Bite? No. Is it it isn't it um um uh, 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 Unity Worldwide Records? Yes. So you're talking what's about the, now. You're talking yeah, about what's now. The, yeah, what's Sven. the connection? Because Sven. you you sent me a bunch of stuff a while back. Okay, so yeah, I'm wondering what this the, is. What's the connection between you, Unity Worldwide, and Sven Billy, uh, Billy Sven? Right. I, I'm going to tie it all together. You ready for okay. this? Okay. So this, this is, is what. So, you, this is how you and I connected. Well, here you go. So so here's what it is. Um, it just so happens when I was working with Brad X, we met these guys that were in a band called Ignite. And the Ignite guys, Brett, right. woo-hoo, what's up? Joe D. Foster was a guy that's kind of like a punk guy, kind of like a yep. punk legend from Huntington Beach. They played Brad and I demos, and I saw their band way back in the dinosaur days, way back in the dinosaur days. Um, it just so happened that Brett and Joe, so when Brad and I weren't, before we started Humble Gods, we were in the club business kind of putting on raves and discos and shit like that. Mm-hmm. And these two toe heads would always show up and, you know, cause they were like blue eyes, like just strikingly good looking model looking dudes with like white hair and blue eyes, you know? And they'd be like, dude, can we get in the show? And we became friends with them. And so part of that whole Pat Dubar uniform choice, da, 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 that ties all back to them. Long story long, when we started doing field day, Joe D. Foster reached out to me and he's like, dude, you got to put your records out on Unity Worldwide. And I'm like, what's that? And he's Joe was 
kind of grooming bands and cherry picking bands from America to I then see. give to Sven and Sven would put them out through his label in Europe, in Germany. Got it. How's that? Did I answer it well? Yeah, that made sense. And, and, cool. and initially you sent me our records, right? Probably. Yes. So no, yes, you, that's how the first, that's how we first contacted. I, I got a package from you with our yes. records in it. <laughs> yes. So, so it just so happens like, remember before I was talking about like, I'm kind of a music guy and, and I, I, I'm pre Nirvana. So I believe yeah. in like, you help people out. Sure. You help people. Like that's what you Absolutely. do for the better. Right. Absolutely. That's, that's my thread, dude. That's where I go for. Absolutely. That's where I come from. Yeah, so yeah. it just so happened. Sven was like, Hey dude, I'm going to sh- send you a box of records. Can you send them to the bands in America? Maybe it was right. cheaper for him. I don't know. I and I'm okay. like, of course. And so he sent me a list of like, send two to these guys, two to these yeah. guys, two to these guys. And so I was helping a friend out. Got that's it. it. K- 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 <laughs> um, yep. Um, you know, in my notes, because we're starting to wind down a little bit, but I know you do work as a music editor and you uh-huh. work, you've worked on Beauty and the Geek and The Biggest Loser mm-hmm. on, on television, on, 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 on television shows, um, mm-hmm. Identity, Age of Love and Make It or Break It. What exactly is a music editor? So the really quick version of that is I also did Biggest Loser, like a ton of right. Biggest Losers. Yeah, Huge. I mentioned that. Yeah, um, biggest Loser. Yeah. Uh, um, a- a- so basically what happens is somebody else is writing the music and they might write 127 songs for a show for that I season. See. Okay. okay. And then the um, producers lay down the music similar to temp tracks, how you would do temp tracks when you're kind of organizing things. Uh-huh. Okay. And they kind of block in what they think the music would be for each thing. Then they would send me the pro Tools sessions and I would have to go back in and clean up and make the show work in 46 minutes. So transitions might flip a song. Like I know what track they're doing there. They might even give me uh, a song that they think they have the licensing for. And then they're like, oh shit, we don't have the licensing for that. So that's basically what it is. And my role was to go in and take the ideas that the music supervisor had between the music supervisor and the producer and make those cues for lack of a better word work uh, in, in in a linear way that's the long and the short of it so Makes so I, I became kind of like a I, i'm i'm um i'm advanced at pro tools <laughs> i'm advanced i'm an advanced pro tools guy and that's <laughs> kind of how that came about like i just well how did i get into pro tools I, my demos didn't sound good i wanted to get better demos and so I taught myself Pro Tools. I got certified in Pro Tools. And from time to time, people will ask me like, dude, can you edit this? Can you edit that? And yeah, that's like one of the things I could do. Long story short. And you've done a bunch of film and TV scoring too, right? I More on the uh, scoring is when you say scoring, that to me, that means more like this, like Hans Zimmer and stuff. And I'm more like a a noise guy. So things noise related, yes, but usually more like tracks in a movie so one of the biggest sinks that i got was similar to the crow would have been a song that i did i got a co-write on that was a cottonmouth king song called positive vibes that went out on this film called the real cancun Mm. you know those are the ones where you go "Hmm, not bad uh so getting songs like sinks in in films um some that kind of stuff i'm one of those guys that sometimes for a, a minute when somebody would want to do, let's say they want to do, I don't know, they want a Green Day song and they can't afford a Green Day sync license. They'd be mm-hmm. like, Doug, can you write something like this? Can you do sure. something like that? So could, you was, give it, was, could you give us something with a Green Day vibe, you know? Green Day-ish. Like, but we don't, you Green know, Day-ish. So, yeah. Green Day-ish. So yeah, John, whatever. Yeah. Okay. John Mee says, what's up, Doug? Will Field Day eventually do something a little more off the punk path like the DAG Field Day LP? Um, I'm going to have to say you're going to have to wait for that one. So when you start talking about the DAG Field Day EP, um, re- or that LP, remember, LP, excuse me. People, LP. people didn't like that. They yeah, freaking right. were pissed off at, at me for writing weird songs. Um, right. I yeah. would never say never, but the, in my weird jaded brain, 
Field Day is a band that like when we play, we play for people that like to see punk bands and run around in a circle and jump off the stage and shit. That's what it is. So I'm not quite sure doing the ambulance song again or writing La Panita or a song like that would be um, the smartest thing to do. But uh, we just mix it up. You know, I mean, we're capable of doing whatever, you know, whatever. So I don't know. It's, it, it's a little early to say, but we, we really do write music. Like I, I, we write songs for people that like to go fast and punk as opposed to experimental stuff. Yeah. And, and, and I can relate to that just in doing, you know, what we've done, you know, with antidote and moving forward. It's like at this stage of the game, we kind of want to do stuff that, that people are going to expect from us and enjoy you know, and not do something totally off, off the, uh, off the rails. Just, just, I, just, I, yeah, just with what, I, we know what our audience is and we mm -hmm. enjoy doing what we're doing and we're part of that audience too. But that mm -hmm. said, we just, we just rebranded ourselves and we have, a, and we're, we're a new band. So everything's wide open to us right now. And that's very exciting. Right. I, and, and keep in mind that sometimes, um, Peter also is a, has kind of like an experimental okay. uh, lane in him. And so if we were going to do something that was really that far off the rip, we would just right. do it as a, as a side project, sure. something that, as a that, side that project. Sense. Like yeah. if you were to ask Peter, like, Peter, what are you listening to right now? It would not surprise me if he was listening to like the sounds of parking lot noise. Yeah. Like, sure. Like that's <laughs> city he's, he's listening to He's listening to Alan Lomax field recordings, you know, like ambient, yes. ambient field recordings. Like, wow. yes, for freaking sure. So, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. You know, that's, yeah. that's where he is, but um, I love him know, for it. That's how, where he is. One thing that we talked about um, earlier when we were chopping it up in the pre-show was um, sort of long longevity and, mm -hmm. you know, not, not, not the big secret of longevity, but, you know, we were talking about touring and how, mm -hmm. how for a lot of bands and guys um, our age, mm -hmm. like, you know, you don't go out and do, you know, uh, like a month in a row. At this stage of the game, and what, what suits you and suits the band is, you know, you go out and do like, uh, or explain kind of how you, explain what works for you guys at this stage of the game as far as like touring and playing shows go. So the magic number for Doug is 16. After 16, after 16 shows, I'm like, I'm ready to go home. I, you know, um, I, couldn't do, I couldn't do anything near that, but yeah, right. God oh, bless. I, can, I can, I can do it, but that's my magic number. That's I when couldn't. after, after 16, then I'm like, I want to sleep in my own bed, <laughs> you know, that, that kind of stuff. Um, also as a, so that that's the long and the short of it is there. I, I know right. me to know what, that there's a, there's a, a cutoff where it's like, sure. eh, it's not as much fun. Um, what field day does is it's kind of the best of, of all the worlds in that we do a lot of fly dates and we'll fly into a place and we'll do four shows Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday and fly yeah. home. I mean, that, so, that's, and, and those are the best days of the week, right? Mm -hmm. Those are the best yeah. days of the week. And also what it does is it allows us to be very mobile in that I'm not trying to grind my way from, you know, Gainesville to get up to Nashville. So then I could get over to Kansas city. I would just fly into Kansas city and do a couple shows around there and then fly back. So um, in a way it's working smarter as opposed to harder, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, uh, and, and that's really it. So it's sometimes there's a lot of lonely Mondays and Tuesdays that are very challenging to fill. Um, and, there's a one model is for the people is there's this 10 day model where you do kind of like two weekends and you try to get two yeah, weekends yeah, right, in and right, everybody sure. goes home. Um, sure. And then the other one is the four day, you know, for when field day is really moving fast, we might do three, four day weekends in a month. Like we're, we're still out doing shows. We just yeah. go and come back, go and come back. And that kind of sure. works for us. Um, and, and you yeah. guys all don't live in the same place either. Right. Correct. So, so uh, that, that comes uh, into play, the, the, the logistics, just the, the geography of it all. Yes, but we actually have a slightly different workaround. So um, Kevin Drummer, Shea guitar player, and Doug, myself, we all live in Los Angeles, and we rehearse often. 
We rehearse as uh, a trio with me on I vocals. See. I and see. then we bring yeah. in Peter. He'll fly in and we'll do rehearsals. Yeah. Or we'll go to a thing and we'll do sure. a long sound check. So we've kind of like, we're a very uh, oiled machine. But yeah. we do a lot, it, of band, we a lot of bands. A lot of bands do that. It, it's you know, you know, and just hope the singer has you know has it together. Hey, Sean McNally, our friend up in Boston, says, "Damn, I'm way Ooh. too late to today's party. Gonna have to watch the replay." What's up, Doug? Boston was a blast in November. Thanks again. Thank you for having us. It was great to see you, and we had a great show with Moving Targets. Thanks. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> great. And uh, uh, P. Alpert says, "Playing any festivals this year?" Uh, I'm not sure if we're going to be doing any festivals. Let me think about that for a second. Um, festival, like real festivals. No, we're not doing as it stands right now. We're not doing anything that would be like festival festivals did one off. Yeah, and we're no, gonna nothing probably, like, like rebellion fest or, or anything no, like that. No, no. So, so that all, all that starts to become super complicated. And a lot of the festivals are playing catch up from all the shows that got canceled yeah, before. Right, right, right. So sure. there's a very long queue. Um, there's a very long queue for, for hey, us to do And we have this little it. clip. You know what? Here you go. When you speak for no one, you speak for all of us. What are you going through? Are your dreams coming true? I shouldn't speak the truth. I have no right to say it. My mispronunciations. So you're heading Ripping. out and playing. You're playing out. You're going to Omaha and Kansas City. Well, that's I don't want to say that's random, but but that's interest. That's an interesting two shows. Yeah. So um, the way that works is is uh, both the pr the promoters reached out to me and they were asking if we could come up that way. And then when COVID hit, things kind of slowed down. And yeah. so now we're back to you know three, four shows. Like, the way that one will work is we'll fly into Kansas, we'll drive up to Omaha, we'll knock out a show, we'll drive back to Kansas, knock out that show, and then we'll get on a plane and fly home, which is how sure. it works. So that's what yeah. we do. Um, so even though it might seem a little random, like, wow, you're playing in the middle of the country or whatever, it's like, yeah, we just, if they have a major airport, we just fly into the airport, rent a van, and we're off to the races. Hey, I want to, I want to, um, I want to shout out. Hold on. I want to shout out my latest patron, Mr. Terrence Cullinane. Thank you for supporting the show. I like, I like, when, I like when there's a cause and effect with this show. Like, you know, I yeah. like when I put, I like when I put in hard work and then someone comes on board. That makes me feel really good, you know, because at, at this point, I'll be honest, you know, this show is, this show in a lot of ways has become my life and my livelihood. And there's so much connected to it. And it's my passion. I love it very much. And, and I'm very fortunate to have, uh, you know, so many people that support it. So, you know, thank you yeah. all so much. And if there's anybody else out there for whatever perverted reason you have, want to, want to jump on, uh, here, here's, here's, there's, there's the Patreon, uh, ah. Patreon page. Yeah. See, so, so here's what that is. Like people have a lot of different, um, options when it comes to content, what they can watch, yeah. what they did. Da, da, da. And sure. the fact that you're able to do something organic, something honest, something engaging, and it's just a conversation. It's like, we're just talking about music. You love music. I love music. Talk about music. And there are other people that like, some of them might be fans like, holy shit, Doug or Drew or... Yeah. They just want to hear people talk about music and that's kind of it. We, or shall I, I won't speak for you, but I'll speak for myself and say, I love music through and through. And I get a ton out of long form interviews because you get to really kind of get a better understanding of people's personalities. You can so speak, this, you can speak for me, bro. <laughs> yeah, so, so this, this show gives the opportunity for music lovers to check out and meet band guys yeah. that maybe they're like, oh shit, you played on that record or you wrote that song or whatever. Yeah. And you go, wow, that guy's kind of uh, in a way approachable. That's what it is. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm uh, fortunate in the regard that uh, part of it, you know, was thought out. Part of it was stumbled upon is that the format gives people was, was gives people the opportunity like Ashley. Hey, Ashley, you should get Milo on here. Drew, well, thank you, Ashley. You know, we'll reach out to my, you know, and so it's a very inter, it's it's a very interactive type of thing. And 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 that's 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 
it's that's it's kind of it's it's kind of cool in a way because the Terrences of the world are what keeps it running and the Ashleys right. of the world that's are right. what keeps it running. So they both totally rock, but it also right. keeps you sharp because you know <laughs> what they want. And yeah, now here's true. somebody saying like like rant, like dude, you should get Milo and you go, "Yeah, okay." You know, so sure, yeah. <laughs> does that mean that you shouldn't have other people, no, but you can get almost instantaneously learn yeah. what your audience, however big, whatever that reach is, yeah. that's what they want it. That's what they, that's what they would find interesting is for you to have a conversation about music and life and art and coffee and blah, 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 blah with Milo. Can we, can we, can we talk a, a couple of people have asked about uh, your, um, and I'm paraphrasing your gear um, are, uh, and, and what, what, as a bass player, what are you playing these days? Guitar? Do you enjoy playing guitar more than bass? Or let's start with bass. Are, are, are you are you a, are you a, a Fender Precision guy? I was a Fender Precision guy. Yeah, I, I right? am a Fender Precision guy. However, as of the last let's say ten years, I've been using yeah. a Fender Mustang bass. Thank you. To oh Fender. wow! And uh, Ernie Ball strings. Thank you to Ernie Ball, my guy's there. Uh, and so that's kind of what I've been doing. So the same way Watt moved over to a three-quarter scale uh, bass, I moved over to a three-quarter scale bass too because it's kind of lighter and a little bit easier to move around. And sure. I, I love how much kind of like growl and bite, or, you know, kind of fret growl I can get out of a brand new pack of um, strings uh, and and... Uh, the bass is totally stock. Um, so answering your question about bass, like I still have the Descendants bass that I played. Uh, like I can show you the bass that I played on. We got a Dankos and I can show you the bass that I played on Enjoy. Wait there. Yeah. And I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to Stand dig by. out of, yeah. Okay. Go Stand ahead. By. Great stuff. Yeah. So here you go. So this is, this is most of the people like you, you remember that photo of me jumping with Dag Nasty. It was the one sure. that Ken took. Sure. That's the same base. Okay. Wow. But this particular, and you see the, like the dugout, like that's how hard I would play with a pick. Wow. Okay. I know it's nerdy and stupid. There's the headstock for all you base ninjas or whatever. But the thing is <laughs> that particular base is in my, it has a certain kind of like value personal value to me and so i really can't take it out on the road because <laughs> yeah. i'd be too worried that it would get pinched um because punkers are crazy and vans get how many how many times this year have you heard about a band getting all their gear wiped out <laughs> that's, such a just, west, oh. that's such a west coast term like we punkers we we've yeah. never you know we've never that's like a like Henry Raw punkers, like black punkers. flag, all the punkers. Punker, all the punkers never, going crazy. Never, that's so not in our lexicon on the East Coast, punkers. Sorry, yeah. but so- No, it's okay. So the, no, it's interesting. So, it's, so the thing is, is with the Fender Mustangs, I play them, the Fender Mustang bands are totally stock. And I have two of them, one of them I travel with, and the other one is here. And God forbid I were to get to an airport and it wouldn't be there. My wife could FedEx it or I could- yeah. go to guitar center and pick one up. So I play a very simple uh, uh, bass setup only in that like, um, yeah, just in case anything got swiped and something like that. And then as far as gear goes, I tend to like, um, I'm, a, I'm a SVT guy if I can get it, but my back doesn't like it. <laughs> yeah. Those big bass cabinets and shit. So if I'm, not, if I'm not the guy moving it and they have backline and they're supplying backline, for sure Ampeg SVT across the board. Eight tens. Uh, if I'm the guy moving it, I'm a little bit more like hmm, I have to get a different rig for, for this gig. So yeah. it depends. Um, I was just looking for my Fender Must by pictures of me with the Fender Mustang from when I was a teenager. Fender Mustang is a solid workhorse, pun intended. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, but what, what in the transition from from the I guess the smaller scale, I, I guess that's that's not too difficult. That's easy. It's it it doesn't it's yeah, yeah. it's not that big of a deal at all. And and I think yeah. that um sometimes it, everybody's different in what it's it's almost like a um I'm going back to your baseball thing before where yeah. Baseball players, they could probably hold a bat and they know like, yep or nope, 
right yeah, off the rip. Right, right, and right. for me, I can hold a guitar. I don't even need to play it. I can hold a guitar like this and I could go like, yep or nope. And, and that's kind of it. So when it comes to bass, I think that it's a really, it's a great answer to people that are traveling a lot. Um, it's a little bit lighter. So if you're, if you're playing long gigs, you know, you don't, you're not killing your back as, as bad holding that big old beast, you know, for all night. Um, yeah. And, you know, um, you know, as long as you're having fun and playing, there you go. It doesn't matter what you play. You know, just all right, fun. here you go. Stick this in your pipe and smoke it. Picture this. Got? 1981 up in Boston with the Fender Mustang bass right there. I love and, it. and look what's on the bass, the black flag bars, SOA, you know? Yeah. You're that's, killing it. That that's 1981, bro. That's that's. And then I got one more, one more. Were you playing era. with a pick with a pick or on, with fingers? I think I was just goofing around for the camera. Right. I, I, I think. Oh, I see. But, but here's, here's, Here's another, I mean, this is another goof shot, but here's the, here's the headstock of the Fender Mustang bass from, but look at, look at the bot on that kid at 18 yeah. years, at 17, 18 years old. And, there you uh, go. That's about 5% body fat right there. You're yeah. looking pretty good. 3% body fat. So, yeah. and, 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 and if you notice, I, I like, even though, even though I'm, I'm, I'm in the throes of the first wave of American hardcore, I have the Rolling Stones, um, emotional rescue poster in on the wall so there you go um, i think the stones are pretty punk in their way you know yeah, they're, yeah. they're pretty, I mean, they, pretty they, outlaw they, they, sort of, they never they never um they never fell out of favor um speaking of speaking of outlaws i, I like you kind of got the outlaw you kind of like got the johnny cash thing going here is yeah. that I can't tell what kind of acoustic you're playing there is is that a um that's a fender acoustic guitar oh that, yeah okay yeah Yep. Yep. I yeah, was gifted, for sure. I was gifted this Yamaha when I was in Israel and uh, by one of the guys in Eternal Struggle, and I love it, man. It sounds great. Yeah. I yep. think I think just playing things and making music and changing it up, it's all it's a beautiful thing across the board. Absolutely. Um, all right. Well, hey, that was a lot of fun, bro. Ooh, that was that super really cool. was. That was Thank really you, great. I, 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 and I knew it was good. I knew it was going to be great, man. I, I, I did. I, I, I know before these things happen now, you know, I've done so many of them, but is there yes. anybody as we're heading towards the door, is there anybody you want to shout out sponsors? Um, you know, anybody you want to thank anybody you want to acknowledge? Sure. So off the rip, I want to say hi to the guys. Get looking forward to seeing everybody in Omaha, Peter and the gang. Um, Sven from Unity Worldwide and Joe Foster, thank you for the help. All the fans that purchased the vinyl, thank you for the help. Um, Sean Duffy in Chicago, what's going on? Uh, let's see, Ernie Ball, thanks, Mr. Dove, for hooking us up. Appreciate it. Uh, that's kind of a, that's kind of about it there. Um, for the people that are in the Midwest-ish, I know one of the things that's slightly different, and I, I know you're closing the show. Well, one of the things that's slightly different okay. is we do have we do have people that fly in for shows. So, mm -hmm. which is just like what you're talking about, where you have people flying in for the punker, the hardcore sure. shows. Um, yeah. Same thing. So for the people that are flying in safe travels, we'll see you in Omaha or Kansas city. You know how we do it. We're going to do the show. We'll play for about an hour. And if you want to hang out and do photos and all that stuff, we'll do it afterwards. Um, so we'll see you in some of you in Kansas city and some of you in Omaha. Uh, so there's that. And um, yeah, that's kind of a, that's, that's about all I got. That's, that's about it. Thanks to the crew. Hey, Dr. I'll, Strange. Yeah. Thanks to Dr. Strange. Thanks to Little Rocket in the UK. Graham, the guys from Leatherface. Graham. Hey, Graham. What's going on? <laughs> we do have, real quick, we do have a reissue coming out. It's supposed to be coming out in November. Um, okay. All the songs, Field Day's done, plus dot, 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 two new ones that have been in the can, so get ready. Uh, so that's going to come out on Little Rocket in the UK, and it should come out on Dr. Strange here in the United States. Fantastic. Well, hey, you know, I've said it before. I'll say it again. Uh, you're always welcome. We'd love to have you at one of our Thank all you, ages, David. you know, uh, Bowery shows. And, and if you ever want to, if you can make it up this way, you know, we'll work it out. We'll, we'll, we'll whatever, whatever the details need to be. But we'd really love to have you up here. I, and, ever... and we'd love to do it for sure. Yeah. Like, well, now it's it's on. So you do most of those are like Sunday matinees, like the old CBs they're, ones? They're all, all I do is Sunday. I do them once a month. It's a Sunday matinee. It's free. It's all mm -hmm. ages. 
And is it like the last Sunday of the month, the first Sunday no, of the month? No, What's no, it depends. Just yeah, random. It depends. You know, it, it's it kind of goes with, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. Because some Sundays are holiday. You know, so yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I move it around. I try to do. I try to do one a month. Um, it's it's real yeah. tough for me this summer because I have a new film that's out and doing the festival circuit. I'm tra basically traveling the world screening the film, but I'm trying to make this show work. And it's but it's all good. I'm a I'm a fortunate, grateful guy. Well, definitely. Like you, we'll, I will put it on my, uh, I'll put it on my radar and the, <laughs> for sure the next time we're, yeah. Cause it, for us, like we love to play. So we'll just, next yeah. time we come through, we'll try to, you know, we'll, especially for the Sundays, like I can, the only thing that's a little challenging is usually we play late the night before. So Saturday into an early load for a Sunday, but I've done them before. <laughs> you know, Those it's early TV shows. <laughs> What's happened to me is I'm so conditioned now after this pandemic and doing this show because I get up very early to set this. And I know you're an early morning guy, too. I get up so early <laughs> to, to set up this show. And the only shows we've played are matinees that I can't even function past six o'clock at night anymore. <laughs> oh, rad. That's right. Yeah. What time did you what time did you reach out to me today? It was it was. Like 8 a.m. my time, 5 a.m. your time. <laughs> I'm up and drinking you, coffee. And, you, and, 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 before, and before I text, I'm like, I hope this guy is, you know, is it too early to text this guy? Is he going to think I'm at him? And I, and I let it go. And then two minutes later, you responded. Yeah. So that was See, great. that's all the, that's all the surfing. Like surfing is a morning yeah. thing. So I'm a morning guy. <laughs> sure. All right, man. Take care. All right, and brother. We'll talk soon. Appreciate you. Be good. Bye, guys. Yeah, Thanks pleasure. for checking it out. Well, there you have it. Great show today. I want to thank everybody from around the world that tuned in. I am very, very fortunate um, to be at the helm of such a great show and have so many people uh, like yourselves that support it. So thank you so much. I want to thank our guest, Doug Carrion, and we wish him all the best uh, in his endeavors. Great guy. Uh, it was, that was a great show. Um, lots of exciting stuff going on. And, uh, you know, we'll see many people coming up this Saturday, including this guy. I wore it earlier to go get lunch. <laughs> oh, wait, Are you going to be in the park on Saturday? Oh, I should be, Drew. I should be there at 7 o'clock in the morning. All right. It's going to be don't a bring, long don't bring day. No don't bring no bullshit into the park, Sid. Oh, no, no, Drew. The bullshit will come regardless, and I have, I'll have nothing to do with it. All right. That that's Rap, that's Rapone the... says Rapone says I'll see you in the pit. All right. Yeah, there's no such thing as retirement, Rapones. Once you're in, you're in. There's no retirement. That's right. All right, Sid. I'll talk to you later. All right, later on. All right. Well, there you go. Big show in the park on Saturday. Hope to see you there. Um on Sunday. What do we got on Sunday? Oh, you know what Sunday is? Oh man. No sleep for the wretched, I tell you, man. Sunday. Oh, God, I got some homework to do, man. This Sunday is the Lemoore's, uh, the Lemoore's um, retrospective with DJ Alex Kane. Oh, we got to get, I oh, got to get, uh, who am I going to reach out to? You know who would be good? I should reach out to Danny Loker. He's always a good Lemoore's guy. Maybe one of the biohazard guys. I got to reach out to some people. I got to get some special guests on this show. That said, yeah, Chris. Hey, Chris Hoffman, we'll see you on Saturday, man. Hey, Rick, thanks thanks for tuning in and being so knowledgeable and asking so many great questions. Yo, got to shout out Stephen Ozzy Oswald, the original drummer for the High and the Mighty. You know? Larry Kelly, my man. Couldn't do it without you. That said, let's clear the deck. Let's say goodbye. This is... Oh, what was that? Yes. Sean McNally, Doug's a solid dude. Well done as usual, Drew. Sorry, I won't make it to Tompkins this time. Prior commitment, enjoy. We will, and and thanks, thanks for tuning in. Um, thanks for tuning in. Uh, that said, uh, thanks a lot. Let me get my my little thing there, and uh, we will see you on Sunday for the for the Lemoors. If if we don't see you in the park, so until then, thanks for everything. I'm going to go make some dinner, okay? Until then, do good things and good things will come to you.